Okay, so this is lecture three of Philosophy XL 150, Society and Morals. Uh, this lecture will be on the Primarat's article on the morality of prostitution. This has a brief outline for how we'll be uh, proceeding in this lecture, how I'll be proceeding. Uh, first, I'll have uh, a short discussion of some terminology and comments on some questions that students submitted on the Primarat's, uh, some pointers about how they can continue to be improved. Then I'm going to move into a discussion of the Primarat's article and the different points that he makes about uh, the morality of prostitution or its immorality, supposed immorality. And I'll be discussing also, uh, in a bit of a tangent, uh, topics of liberalism, perfectionism, and paternalism. They're raised in the uh, first or second section of the Primarat's article and uh, for a variety of reasons, they're relevant beyond that section. I'll discuss that when I get there. And then I'll close with a brief discussion of the, um, your, or sort of foreshadowing of the Iraqo article. So first, uh, some terminology, concepts, and questions. Okay, so first I want to discuss the terms empirical and contingent. They're uh, quite related. The term empirical figures... Uh, Frequently in the Iraqo article, the term contingent not so much, but they're important to understand. I should say that when you see terms that you don't understand, um, it is in the end your responsibility to find out what they mean, and there are different ways you can do that. Uh, one source is the Stanford Enci Encyclopedia of Philosophy, uh, which is a nice online source. Um, I'll, I suppose I can post a link to that. Um, and then also you can contact me. If you don't know what a word means, then I can tell you or direct you to a source. Um, but that said, uh, here's th these are important terms that I want to take the initiative to tell you about. So, empirical is a word that applies to propositions. A proposition is something that's true or false. It could be a sentence, it could be a belief, it could be an assertion, it could be a judgment, things like that. And... Uh, an empirical proposition is one that requires perceptual evidence uh, for you to know whether or not it's true or false. It requires um, investigating the world partially in reliance on one's senses to know whether or not it's true. So simple examples, if you want to know what the shape of an object is, what the color of an object is, what the texture of an object is, uh, those uh, propositions about an object's shape are going to be empirical because the only way in which you can find out about what uh, shape an object has is through uh, perceptual investigation by looking at it or touching at it or talking to someone who has looked at it or uh, touched it or, or somehow relying on information derived from somebody who's seen it. Um, in general. Now, you might rely on a background theory, like, so I know that this, you know, object came from this factory, and this factory makes, um, uh, you know, only makes, uh, cubes. Well, but even there, you know, your, your knowledge that the factory only makes cubes, your knowledge that the object came from the factory, those are presumably going to be empirical as well, uh, requiring empirical, uh, requiring perceptual investigation. And so, uh, the vast, um, preponderance of our knowledge about the world, in fact, is empirical. Scientific theories are empirical. You know, you don't directly observe that uh, force is, well, mass times acceleration, except that's not exact, that's not what it is sort of now thought to be. Um, but the point is, you don't go out and just deserve, uh, observe that, but you do, it's part that different scientific sort of theoretical claims are, part of, are parts of well-established uh, scientific theories and the scientific theory as a whole is tested um, perceptually um, through particular predictions that it makes. A contingent proposition is one that might be true or it might be false. So the first claim, the first kind of proposition, empirical or not, is about how we come to know it. Contingent is about its uh, whether or not it's necessary uh, or not. So could it be true, could it be false? So an example of a contingent proposition is I am wearing a blue shirt. Didn't have to be wearing a blue shirt. Um, what are some necessary propositions? Well, perhaps, or certainly 2 plus 2 is 4 is a necessary proposition. Um, I am a human may be a necessary proposition. You might think that um, anything that uh, is not a, a human could not be me, that I couldn't change my species. Um, so, 
usually empirical and contingent go together. That is, um, if it's empirical, it's contingent, and if it's contingent, it's empirical. Um, now, there are non-empirical unnecessary propositions. So, if I was born on a Wednesday, then I was born on a Wednesday, that's necessary. Uh, if the antecedent is true, then so is the consequent. If the antecedent is false, so is the consequent. But all that's important is if the antecedent is true, if I was born on a Wednesday, then yep, I was born on a Wednesday. Don't need to know whether or not I actually was born on to know whether or not I was actually was born on a Wednesday. That would require investigation, and that's presumably contingent. I could have been born on another day, but the conditional claim uh, is necessary and uh, doesn't require knowing any empirical facts. Uh, one plus zero is one. One plus one is two. Are non-empirical and necessary. All else equal, it is wrong to violate, violate autonomy. If that's true, it's probably uh, non-empirical and uh, certainly necessary. Now there, uh, so in general, being uh, empirical and being uh, contingent are equivalent. Although uh, I should say that in recent philosophy, there's been sort of interesting discussions of ways in which they're non-equivalent. That is to say, ways in which you have contingent, but um, uh, non-empirical propositions and necessary but empirical propositions, but we don't need to worry about those. The point, the upshot is, when someone says something is empirical, um, in a philosophy paper, uh, w the implications are, one, it's not the kind of thing that we can figure out um, in, uh, by doing philosophy, we'd have to go and do scientific experimentation, and two, it's pr it may they, they tend it tends to mean that it's not relevant to determining the issues at hand because we think look we can figure out uh, the na you know whether or not prostitution is for example moral without uh, determining these without doing empirical investigation and so when someone says something is empirical they're usually saying it's an issue that uh, is not one that whose truth or falsity, it's not a claim whose truth or falsity would make a difference to the thing we care about, whether or not prostitution is moral, for example. Okay, so on to some of the questions. So, uh, one issue is about focus. So, uh, and this, th this question actually has a couple of problems, but w one is focus, the other is grammar and spelling. So, if we look at the first uh, highlighted sentence in red, or highlighted words in red, this leading to the relationship between impersonal and dehumanizing the female, that is not a sentence. There is no verb uh, in that sentence. There are the words leading and being, but leading and being are not verbs. They're either gerunds or participles. Uh, they're, they're, you take the verb lead or the verb be, and you turn it into an adjective or a noun. Uh, so that's not a sentence, uh, but we need to have sentences uh, when we have capital letters and periods. Um, Primarats, then, then we have this argues this phrase, well, argues what? Um, in general, you want to say that people are arguing for something. Uh, the I here is not capitalized. Um, the next sentence has, or the next set of words has the same problem as the first uh, that I talked about, it is not a sentence. Um, now, Let's actually not worry about the middle part. I think that's mistaken, but it's not so important. So, so far, this has demonstrated that, um, I pointed out that this, the grammar, actually, it's really the grammar in here, uh, not spelling, um, but the grammar needs to be improved. Now, but let's look at the bottom. So, this person has said, you know, they, they've raised this issue about, um, you know, this question, is prostitution um, dehumanizing and personal involved objectification used by men? Various properties of prostitution might have. And so then the, the author of the question then says, is this really a valid effective argument or is just this just Primarats's personal belief that these other jobs are forms of prostitution? If so, are his personal beliefs valid when arguing the morality of the prostitution? So pr the author says he agrees, but um, this is the beginning of a question. It's not the end of a question. You need to uh, explore the question a little bit, and, and much more than is done here. Um, in other words, well, try to figure out, is it a valid, effective argument or not? Um, that's something that you can assess and something that you should try to assess. So there needs to be more exploration uh, of the question that's raised. Um, I think that, that all of these things can be straightforwardly addressed, so I don't think that um, this is sort of a demonstration of, you know, uh, 
impossible sort of standards to achieve. I'm just, I think it's a good example of things that need to be improved and that I'm extremely confident, I'm certain, can be improved. So look for the grammar. And also, when you raise the question, you then need to try to answer it, or at least sort of consider some different possible answers, um, I I as opposed to um, briefly saying, here's what I think the answer might be. Um, so that's common on this issue. Um, this is an example of a, a better question. Um, this is the one that one of the two that was posted in the forums. And here we have the author talking about um, a very specific uh, claim that so Primaratz considers the claim that prostitution is immoral because the prostitute is selling herself or her body. Primaratz uh, attempts to produce counterexamples. He produces several. Um, or, or, or sort of supposed counterexamples, the uh, surrogate mother and uh, the doctor and the nurse. And this author, the author of this question says, or criticism says, okay, I'm going to do a specific thing. I'm going to argue that there's a big difference between the surrogate and the prostitute. So the author of this question is not trying to answer the whole question whether or not morality is prostitution. They're trying to address one point that they take to be very important to that uh, question. And they hone in very specifically on this question of, okay, it, it's important to determine whether or not morality and prostitution is immoral, that we determine whether or not it's moral to sell one's body, and uh, and in, in figuring that out, we need to look at different uh, ways in which one's body might or might not appear to be sold. One of them is surrogacy, so let's examine that issue and compare it with prostitution. Um, so that's a very clear, focused, specific question. And uh, this goes on, uh, as you hopefully recall from looking at the forums, for a little while. This is not the entire question uh, that was submitted or criticism that was submitted. So this is, um, this does do the sort of focus um, that I'm looking for. It does have the sort of focus that I'm looking for. Another thing is that your question should uh, concern a, substan a, a substantive issue that's raised and substantively explored by the article. So um, it will often happen that uh, the author of an article will mention some issues in passing that are relevant, but uh, not really explore them very deeply. Uh, they may be interesting issues. They may be issues that sort of are intrinsically worthy of discussion, but uh, they don't make necessarily good um, questions about the article, because the issue, there's not, there's not much in the article to, uh, to work with in order to try to answer the question or to work out the criticism. So here's an example of this. Um, we have, it is evident that Primerats finds arguments against the morality of prostitution to be flawed. During one point in his argument, he accounts for the perspective of illiberal feminists within the broad spectrum of feminist ideology, stating that they, quote, are likely to dismiss the views of prostitutes as just another case of false consciousness. Now, this is good. The person has picked out a very specific point. That's good. It's focused. The person has used uh, and, and has cited a particular point in the article. That's very good. So they've definitely chosen a specific point, and, and that's a very good aspect of this question. The problem with this question is that Primerat says very little about the uh, illiberal feminists' argument that uh, prostitutes' uh, views of themselves are examples of false consciousness. He says, this is what the illiberal feminists will say. But he doesn't say, uh, he doesn't go into any sort of detail about the illiberal feminists' argument for that position. That makes uh, a discussion of this position not very... Um, it's not going to go very far because we don't have very much to work with. And so uh, while this question has picked up, has done a very good job of specifying a, a particular point, it turns out to be not such a good point for the purposes of a discussion about the article because it's not a, a point that the, that the article discusses very much. So uh, as a model of specifying an issue, it's good, but it doesn't do, it doesn't, um, uh, specify the right kind of issue uh, for the this kind of question and criticism. Uh, this issue of whether or not illiberal feminists and false consciousness and you know whether or not they're what we want to say about that uh, is is I think an interesting question as well. So it may very well be that you see oh here's something in this article that interests me. I would like to talk about it. Well, um, you might like to talk about it, but um, it not 
it, it's not going to be something that we can effectively explore uh, in the class, which is not to say you shouldn't explore it. You should, just that we can't talk about everything. We want to talk about things that we have more material to talk about, more material to rely on in having that discussion. Um, so as I say, substantive and focused issue, but the article does not explore the illiberal feminist argument that prostitutes have false consciousness, which makes it not a, a, a great uh, subject for a discussion. Okay, so I would now like to move on to discuss the uh, Primerats article and the different issues that are raised in that article. So, um, right, the outline. So first I'm going to discuss uh, the positive morality. I'm going to move to his discussion of paternalism. Uh, in that, in my discussion of his, what he has, what he has to say about paternalism, I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent. I'm going to talk about perfectionism, perfectionism, liberalism, and the good life. We'll see what those come to. Um, they are relevant for to things we've already talked about and to things we're going to be talking about. So even though Primerats doesn't go into them in great depth, uh, they're important for me to discuss. I'll then turn to his discussion of the point that some things are just not for sale, and then to his discussion of the feminist worries about uh, prostitution and its morality. Uh, one is that uh, prostitution may lead to the degradation of prostitutes. Primerats thinks it doesn't. I'm going to argue that there may be a sense in which at least a minimally autonomous prostitute is degraded, although uh, so prostitution itself is not necessarily degrading. A certain variety of it very well may be. And I'll also discuss the worry that prostitution may contribute to the oppression of women. Uh, I'm not going to have as much to say about that as I am about the degradation issue, um, I think, because the argument that Primerats discusses is has some empir empirical sort I mean, it's basically, I think he's having an empirical dispute with uh, Laurie Schrag, the author of the um, argument that he discusses. So... Let's discuss positive morality. So um, positive morality is not critical morality in uh, Primerats' terms. So what does uh, positive mean? Well, just to be clear, on one sense of positive, positive uh, basically means good, but uh, I hope it's clear that that's not what was meant in this context. Um, there's a meaning of the word posit, where posit is a verb, and it means to put in place, and that's the uh, etymological uh, root of positive in the phrase positive morality. So positive morality means the morality that has actually been put in place. Uh, by put in place, we mean the morality that the society actually, in some sense, adheres to. It's the positive morality is a body of claims that are the morality of the society, but this word of is actually kind of tricky because what does it mean? Is, does it mean that it's the widely accepted claims? Does it mean that those are the, claim, the moral claims that are enforced? Does it mean that they're the moral claims that are followed? Does it mean that they're the moral claims that are announced by the sort of elites who maybe have some sort of authority? So in, a, say, a theocracy, uh, the religious leaders may say, here are, the, here are the sort of moral rules, and you all need to follow them. Um, so this notion of it's actually kind of tricky saying what the morality of a society is. Um, now, uh, as Primerats raises this uh, Primerats raises this question: Is positive morality the only morality? In other words, is the only um, uh, sense in which there are uh, morally binding claims the sense in which uh, different societies just have different moralities? Um, or is there a sense in which um, a society's morality can be mistaken? So I think it's clear that uh, there's more to morality than positive morality. Um, that a society, the fact that a society, um, that a certain moral claim is made in a society does not make it true uh, for everybody or even for people in that society. And Primerats makes a number of points uh, that I think are pretty persuasive uh, in this vein. One is that internal criticism uh, in the society, the kind of sort of reformist criticism that people engage in, uh, would be uh, just incoherent, right? Because you'd be saying, well, I'm a member of this society, and uh, we should change this moral claim. So let's say uh, women should be allowed to vote. Well, uh, and, and sort of in the background, you know, women have the uh, intellectual capacities and the moral status uh, that entitle them to vote, and that's why they should be able to vote, uh, right, which is what you have... Uh, the turn of the century, um, last century. 
Well, uh, that argument would be incoherent um, because the uh, the morality of the society at the time is women don't get to vote. Women aren't uh, the the sort of widely accepted claims are that. Yeah, women uh, don't have the capacities that uh, are required to be, you know, active political citizens. Well, I mean, that's a stupid claim that they don't, um, but, and, and rightly uh, criticized and rightly rejected. Um, but the point is that the, there'd be no reason to uh, reject it if all there was, if the only standard of correctness was just, well, does a society hold a moral claim or not? Because the society said they didn't, and so... If all there was to morality was what the society says there is, then there wouldn't be any grounds on which to criticize that claim. So internal reform and change in a, the, the um, moral claims that the people in the society actually accept wouldn't make sense if there wasn't some further standard for uh, the correctness of moral claims, right? I say, you currently believe this, but you're wrong, and here's the standard by which you're wrong. Uh, again, you'd have this problem of some things would be right here and wrong there. So a good example of this would be uh, female circumcision, female genital mutilation. So certainly that's not accepted in our society, but it is uh, accepted, thought to be very important in some uh, other societies. Um, I think it's quite clear that that's wrong, and the fact that it's part of the positive morality of those societies does not make it right. Um, so it should be said in this context that uh, this doesn't mean that every society has to be exactly the same. There's room, there may be sort of relatively abstract, universal moral norms that get um, implemented and realized in different ways in different societies. So just as a simple example of this, um, different cultures have different conventional norms and different conventions for uh, respecting one's interlocutor, the person that one's talking with. And so uh, it's important in general that in a discussion one respect one's interlocutor, but the way in which you go about that might be quite different in different societies, and that's just fine. Um, so there's certainly room for more specific norms, uh, more specific moral claims about morality to be dependent on features of a society, but um, that doesn't mean, and so we can allow for societal variation in morality uh, to some extent while uh, saying that there are standards for correctness for moral claims that um, are not just determined by whatever the society says they are. And as Primaratz also points out, positive morality can be inconsistent. There's no particular reason why a, the different moral claims that a society adopts uh, are all consistent. He argues that the society's views of prostitution on the one hand and marriage on the other hand are inconsistent. Um, whether or not he's right about that specific example, the general point that positive morality can be inconsistent uh, is I mean, that's just obviously true, that it can be, and you don't want to have uh, an inconsistent moral system. So, again, Positive morality is not the be-all and end-all. Now, it should be noted, however, that once you deny that positive morality uh, is the correct view of morality, so you have opened up yourself to saying, uh, these people in this other society have this mistake in morality, or these people in my society have a mistake in morality. But, of course, you're also open to the possibility of them criticizing you, and uh, it might be that you're wrong, in fact, and that they're right. So there's no way in which uh, sort of it, we can reject the idea that we can advance the idea that there are uh, certain abstract universal moral norms, that the standards of correctness for moral claims are not just determined or set by whatever the society um, uh, lays down, without uh, getting into a position where we in particular are telling other people um, what the actual moral norms are. Just because there are, just because you think that there are universal moral norms, doesn't mean that you have special access to that fact. The people in the other society may actually be doing a much better job of figuring out what's morally correct and what's morally incorrect. So uh, this doesn't, this rejection of uh, sort of total social relativism about morality does not imply that um, Western moral norms are in fact always correct. It doesn't imply it doesn't imply they're it doesn't imply they're correct at all. Um, it's just a further mit, uh, issue then, which ones are correct. Okay. So I'd now like to turn to the p issues of paternalism. Um, 
So there are different questions uh, related to uh, well, that are related to paternalism that arise in Primarat's discussion. One is the question: just is prostitution immoral? Second question is: do individuals or society have a moral burden to stop or penalize or otherwise intervene against prostitution? And a third question is, if we think that the society should be engaging in intervention, uh, should, that form, should that intervention take the form of telling the prostitutes that what they're doing is immoral? Uh, so it might be helpful here to, say, to contrast um, um, claims about prostitution with, let's say, uh, anti-obesity campaigns um, so that one might say, yeah, you know, the society should be engaged in anti-obesity campaigns, but it shouldn't be telling people that obesity is immoral, just telling people that it's unhealthy. And so there's a question as to whether or not uh, society's intervention, should it be correct for society to intervene, uh, to stop prostitution, uh, how should it do it, and how should the uh, intervention be formulated? Primarats uh, doesn't really, unfortunately, pull these uh, claims apart. Mostly, he seems to be focused on the second one, and, but uh, that doesn't actually establish, he, he, and he thinks that the answer to that is no. Individuals in society do not have a moral burden to stop or penalize or otherwise intervene against prostitution. In fact, they have a moral duty to uh, abstain from doing so, uh, at least um, in many contexts. Now, that wouldn't show that prostitution was moral, though. You might think, as we'll see, that it's uh, immoral, but that you shouldn't intervene to stop it. So the question of is it immoral versus should society or individuals in the society try to do something about it, those are different questions. And the relation between those two questions is actually quite complicated, and Primarats, unfortunately, doesn't really deal with that fact. So... Um, but the paternalism issue is really has to do with the second and the third, about intervention to stop people from doing certain things and what kind of uh, form that intervention should take. So, so as I said, Primarat says that we should not condemn prostitution. We shouldn't condemn it morally or otherwise. Just before I get into it, I want to note a, a terminological issue. Primarat uses the word sanction. Um, the word sanction is really a... a, 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 a it's a problematic word. It, it's ambiguous, and the um, the meanings its two meanings are opposite from each other, uh, which is very rare and really bad. Um, so one meaning for sanction is like the sanctions we put on Iran. It's a, a punishment of some sort. Uh, the other meaning for sanction is uh, you know the court might uh, sanction. So the Supreme Court sanctioned most of Obamacare. That's a correct statement. Um, that means they approved of it. So on the one hand, sanction means to uh, penalize, and on the other hand, it can mean to approve. So it's a really, really bad word. Um, it would be nice if it meant just one or the other. So you should just be aware of that going forward. When you see the word sanction, you need to, oh, let me think about what they mean for a minute. Okay, that said. Primarats makes the point that it's not obvious that prostitution harms prostitutes, and uh, he concurs with Nussbaum that prostitution is less harmful to the prostitutes if it's legal and if it's not stigmatized. So even if it's not a good thing, uh, there's, that doesn't tell us how we should respond to it. Um, what should we do about it? Should we try to make it go away, and should we attack and penalize the people who do it, or should we try to uh, ameliorate the conditions under which it's done, make it easier for them uh, in general, and uh, make the activity less harmful? So those are two different res routes you could go, and he and Nussbaum, uh, I think correctly, both say um, that the correct response is to try to ameliorate uh, whatever harms prostitution may cause, not to make it illegal and stigmatized. But Primarats, uh, neither of these points have to do with the paternalism issue. Uh, Primarats goes on to say, look, suppose that consensual prostitution did harm prostitutes, that it was bad for them. Nonetheless, pro that wouldn't mean that prostitution was immoral, and even if prostitution were immoral, we shouldn't intervene legally or morally to stop them to stop prostitution from happening. Why? Such intervention would be paternalistic, and paternalistic intervention is bad, he thinks. So, what do we, or at least most paternalistic intervention is bad. What do we mean by paternalism? So, uh, paternalism comes from being a father. Here we have Moses, uh, who uh, was a um, f father who laid down some laws. Um, so, uh, paternalism is intervening, it's, you do it more or less coercively, 
and you intervene in someone's life or the society intervenes because the person is doing something that is harmful to themselves and you're doing it you intervene to get them to stop or there might be that there's something they should be doing to help themselves that they're not and you intervene to get them to do it so uh, you might intervene to stop people from eating uh, food with lots of saturated fat. Um, so that would be an, advan an example of stopping someone from doing something. Or you might intervene to get someone to exercise. Right? So, and that would be an example to get someone to do something. So, right, so let's look at some examples. So um, taxing tobacco and alcohol heavily, criminalizing marijuana to decrease usage. These are all done uh, for partially paternalistic reasons. They're done because it's believed that um, it's bad to, to consume tobacco, it's bad to consume alcohol, it's bad to consume marijuana, and uh, it just uh, there are a variety of reasons why people think this, but one of the reasons they think this is that tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana consumption harm the consumer of the drug themselves. Now, they don't harm it, people who think these different substances should be illegal or restricted tend to think that uh, if one person consumes them, that negatively affects other people because for a variety of reasons, uh, secondhand smoke, um, alcohol leads to, um, let's say, uh, drunk driving, violent behavior, and so on. Um, marijuana, um, it's actually less clear what the third party damages are, um, but... <laughs> Um, the point is, the the paternalistic justification for the regulation is it's bad to smoke tobacco, it's bad to drink alcohol, it's bad to for you to smoke. It, smoking tobacco has bad effects on the smoker, drinking alcohol has bad effects on the drinker, smoking marijuana has bad effects on the smoker, and therefore they should be uh, made to be difficult in one way or another, either criminalized or heavily taxed or otherwise restricted. Um, posting calorie information, promoting exercises so that people make choices that are healthier for them. That, again, is paternalistic. It's not coercion, right? Because you're not forcing the consumer to do anything. You are coercing the, um, the business, but it's not the business that you're trying to protect, right? It's Paternalism is when you coerce, is when you intervene in a person's life to stop them from harming themselves. So... In this case, with the posting, at least, of the calorie information, the intervention is um, taken out on, is done on the, um, actually, maybe this is not such a good example for this reason. Um, well, no, no, that's okay. It is. Because it's, while the um, McDonald's is the one that's, uh, or whoever that is coerced, it's done to stop people from harming themselves by eating the McDonald's food. So this is what we might think of as a softer form of paternalism. It's not coercion. You're not penalizing the people who eat unhealthy food, but you are trying to change their views about it. You're trying to intervene in their behavior and in their minds. Not, again, coercively. You're trying to do so in a, in a rational and respectful way, but it is an intervention. Um, again, credit management classes so that individuals make fiscally prudent decisions. Uh, it's paternalistic, right? We think people aren't financially very um, responsible or uh, or instead are not financially very intelligent um, or, again, are not financially very literate. And it's actually the last one that is what justifies, that is the ground for a lot of these sort of credit management classes. The idea is, look, people just don't actually understand, for example, how compound interest actually affects them. You know, if you draw some graphs of compound interest uh, where you have... Um, you know, if you have compounding interest and you have in interest rates that differ by 1%, that, you know, it leads to massive differences over an extended period of time. People don't appreciate these sorts of things, so uh, we should have credit management classes so that they can um, make wiser credit decisions in their own interest. Again, education more broadly is, uh, in some sense, paternalistic. It's done for the benefit of the people who are being educated. Um, and at least at the at the primary and secondary level, it is coercive. Uh, there are penalties uh, on families if their children are not educated. Um, and even at the university level, there is paternalism involved because you can't just take whatever courses you want. You have to, you know, there, there's right. What's the justification for for GEs? Well, because it would be good for you if you uh, you know took these courses. Um, and you might not agree, but you, nonetheless, that's the justification.
So all of these pol policies arguous, arguably have benefits to the person besides the coercee. So the policies um, are the policies are not purely paternalistic, um, but the justifications are partially paternalistic. Okay, and so in the discussion of the examples, we're distinct. I would sort of have been distinguishing between soft and hard intervention or coercion. So the probably the hardest form of intervention is using force to, uh, you know, physical force um, or even uh, moral force, uh, condemnation or massive praise, um, but physical force in the first instance, um, restraint, death. Uh, somewhat less um, strong, uh, there are going to be incentives and disincentives. So that's, for example, what happens with alcohol and tobacco. There are disincentives, namely uh, high taxes. Um, and then there's uh, persuasion. Oh, well, and, and you know, the tax code, for example, uh, is used um, to, um, in paternalistic ways, to incentivize saving uh, and home buying. Um, because they're 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 financially rewarded because you get deductions for doing those acti for spending money in those ways that you wouldn't get if you spent money in other ways. And finally, there's just persuasion and advocacy, where the the society or the government or the individual says, "Here is what you should do, and here is why." So these are um, different degrees of intervention. Weak paternalism is this claim. It says that society or an individual can justly or morally coerce why. Under some certain, but but they can only do so under some circumstances, namely if Y's decision would not be free without the coercion. So we look at Y; they're going to make a decision, and we ask, "Is Y's decision free?" And if Y's decision is free, then we don't. Then weak paternalism says you're not allowed; it's not uh, morally okay to intervene. But if Y's decision without our intervention would be. Uh, coerced in some way or not free in some way, then we can intervene. So what might that be like? Well, there might be a, th a third party that's coercing the individual, and so we might bring some, uh, you know, pressure to bear on the chooser to act in one way or another. Or uh, the um, the agent might uh, be the victim of fraud. So it might be that um, they've been substantially deceived about um, say an investment um, and so there's a way in which they're not making a free decision because what they think they're choosing is actually not what they're choosing and so you, we might intervene at that point uh, weak paternalism might allow intervention at that point because the decision is not truly free again uh, if the individual is temporarily irrational uh, so that they say um, so um, uh, an example of this would be um, intervention to stop suicides, um, uh, you know, hospital, uh, sort of forced hospitalization. The idea here is that the individual is temporarily irrational and wanting to commit suicide. If the individual was in his or her uh, right mind, which they have been and will be in the future if they don't commit suicide, they would say, no, uh, suicide is wrong to commit, I d or at least for, uh, that, that's not it. It's, I don't want to commit suicide. I want to survive. I want to live on. So we act, uh, the state acts coercively uh, to prevent them from committing suicide and by detaining them in a hospital on the grounds that, not that the state says, we have decided that uh, suicide is bad um, and you shouldn't do it, but rather uh, you think uh, that suicide is bad. But you're somehow, for whatever reason, having trouble accessing that thought right now. Um, and so we're going to prevent you from acting on your current thoughts until you're able to access this thought that you already have. Strong paternalism uh, is a stronger claim. It says that society or an individual can justly or morally coerce why, whether or not wise decision would be free without the coercion. So it might be, so for example, um, you know, consumption of marijuana, um, you can f you can certainly freely choose to consume marijuana, and the society says um, no. Um, you can't do that uh, just even because of the effects on yourself. And so that would be not. 
it, you might be able to argue that the consumption of marijuana would have, uh, if, if it were legal, would have massively negative social effects. And then, if that were the case, well, and let's just suppose for a second that it is, then it would be consistent with weak paternalism to criminalize marijuana. Um, because there would be a justification that didn't have to do with an individual harming themselves who would say, you don't get to consume marijuana because it's going to affect all these other people negatively. But, um, but weak paternalism would not allow us to justify banning marijuana usage on the basis that it harms the individual marijuana smokers, whereas the strong paternalism would allow us, would allow, um, if it were the case that marijuana usage harmed the smokers, the users, strong paternalism would say that is a sufficient ground for intervening, or at least could be, whereas weak paternalism says it definitely is not. So there are different claims about sort of what is the scope of paternalistic intervention. Okay, so I hope that that's made clear sort of what we mean when we talk about paternalism. Um, Oh, and actually, I guess I should have made this explicit. Why uh, uh, do we use the word paternalism? Well, because the idea is that's what a father does. A father intervenes in the life of his children to do things, um, to coerce the children, to influence the children in ways that are for the children's own good, although they don't recognize it at the time. Um, the That's the, the etymology. Um, could as easily be maternalism um, or parentalism, but... Um, Historically, uh, probably for reasons that have to do with feminism and the oppression of women and, and, and the sort of uh, relative gender hierarchies, uh, paternalism is the word we, we use. Okay, so I want to talk about paternalism, liberalism, and perfectionism because they bear on the Nussbaum article, they bear on the Primarats article, and they bear on the Yuraku article and further articles going forward, and I think this is an opportune time to discuss them. These issues are raised in subsequent articles, and they also bear on our own moral discussions, and I think they're also intrinsically important. So I am going to discuss them. So first I want to talk about morality on the one hand and the good life on the other hand. So morality. What do we mean when we talk about morality? Well, at least uh, the word itself is amb ambiguous or at least sort of can be understood and realized and sort of there might be some common core to different ways in which it's used, but there are somewhat different ways in which it's used. So here we're using it to mean it's what one ought to do. Uh, it's about what is right and what is wrong. Uh, immoral action is would be intuitively deserving of blame, of criticism, of guilt. If punishment is ever deserved, it would be deserved for immoral action. Many moral duties are other regarding. That is, uh, I have a moral duty um, towards other people, so um, I can't harm other people in certain ways. There are ways in which I can harm them um, if we're both competing for a prize or if we're boxing or what have you. There are various ways in which things that I do will affect you negatively and it harms you, but it's okay. But uh, there are certain ways in which I can't harm you. I can't uh, just chop off your arm because I would enjoy it. Um, I can't just lie to you for the fun of it and so on. Again, um, I may have to help you in certain ways or in other ways sort of benefit you. So if I make a promise to you, then I have to fulfill the promise. If I make a, sign a contract with you, I have to fulfill the contract. Um, I can't lie to you. I have to tell you the truth if I'm going to talk to you. Um, perhaps if you're about to drown, I can easily save you. I'm morally required to save you. So those are all examples where we would say if you didn't do it, you uh, did something that's wrong mm, and uh, you should change your behavior and uh, you should be criticized for doing what you did. You should feel guilt about it. Um, maybe you should even be punished. So on the other hand, uh, if you do do the right thing, uh, we might think you should be rewarded and recognized for doing that. So question, are there moral duties that are not other regarding? In other words, are there moral duties that are self-regarding? Well, one way in which there might, that there in fact might be such moral duties is uh, in terms of, uh, they might arise in relation to the good life. So, what am I talking about here? So the good life is what's well, generally thought to include at least some degree of morality, although uh, Nietzsche is in effect can be understood as talking about the good life and um, probably would disagree with that claim. He's um, 
Uh, I mean, almost certainly we disagree with that claim, although a lot of his claims, it's hard to tell what he really means. Stimulating, but unclear. But we're going to assume that the good life does include at least some degree of morality, but plausibly there's more to the good life than fulfilling other regarding duties. Um, you could you know, treat other people in the ways that you are supposed to, and yet live a unfulfilled life. Just, you know, you can imagine that you uh, don't have any close personal relationships, you suffer from chronic pain, you aren't able to accomplish any major projects, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, so morally on the up and up, but uh, not living a good life. Well, so what is uh, part of the good life beyond uh, fulfilling one's moral and ethical obligations. Well, as I pointed out in last week's discussion of the notion of a public reason, uh, there's a lot of di dispute about what a, uh, what a good life involves, and it's very hard to reach a conclusion uh, definitively. Uh, it's relatively easy to reach a conclusion, but hard to reach a conclusion that uh, one can sort of persuasively say to other people, this is why, this is not just sort of my conception of the good life, but this is a, the correct conception of the good life and one that you should share. But what might be included in the good life? Well, a minimal idea would just be it's happiness. Um, if you're happy, uh, that's really all there is to it um, beyond you know, fulfilling your ethical duties. But there may be more. So you might think that uh, a good life involves uh, some, something along the lines of flourishing. It involves a full development of your human abilities. And so what might that involve? Well, it might involve uh, being particularly rational. And here I'm, I don't mean sort of cold and calculating, but I mean being um, considered in one's behavior so that you think what are the things that I want to bring about what 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 are the values that I that I think are important how am I going to go about pursuing them and then actually pursuing them in those ways um, and and also just perhaps being reflective about what the um, one's uh, situation in the world um, or Science, perhaps, understanding of the natural world might be an example of a development of a, a way in which humans can flourish um, by developing those capacities. Or, perhaps, in art, uh, humans can flourish. Uh, in social relationships, humans uh, flourish. In uh, athletic endeavor, uh, might involve uh, human flourishing. In fact, this last picture uh, of this um, Greek, it's actually, might be a Roman discus thrower. It's called a discobolus, and I think that's a Latin name. Um, and Greek statuary did tend to be more static than this. Um, at least the early ones did. I don't know. Anyway, the point is, um, the uh, notion of human flourishing uh, is really uh, first uh, really powerfully articulated by Aristotle, at least in the West. Uh, he's one of the very first sort of powerful articulators of um, the notion of human flourishing and the idea that there are sort of a variety of capacities and abilities that uh, we can develop and that it's good for us to do so. And then the good life consists in part in developing these abilities. Rather different, um, well, yeah, different notion of, um, oh, and I, I should have put in, well, social relationships might be more personal as uh, the example of um, Mitt Romney's family, but they could be more uh, impersonal and uh, political uh, in nature. Uh, a different uh, area of the good life might have be the spiritual or religious arena, where uh, the good life would be seen as achieving uh, divine grace, or perhaps uh, achieving enlightenment in a Buddhist tradition. So there are many, uh, uh, all of these different um, views about the good life are going to agree to at least a uh, substantial extent on what one's ethical duties are, um, but then they may branch off uh, they may sort of posit, they may have some differences about ethical duties, but they certainly have uh, differences um, in terms of further claims uh, after you've sort of satisfied your duties towards other people. So one might think, hey, maybe there's a moral duty to pursue the good life. Uh, this would interact with 
uh, whether or not there is is going to interact with the actual view of the good life that you think is correct. So, for example, if you think that all there is to the good life is being ethical plus being happy, it's not clear, I mean, is there really a moral duty to pursue happiness? I mean, you know, if you're lazy and, uh, you know, you don't hurt anybody and you help people when they need it, um, you know, are you are you being immoral by not doing more to make yourself happy? I, I mean, it's kind of lame maybe, but I don't know about immoral. Um, it's more plausible with the further views, but it's still not obvious that there is a moral duty to pursue uh, the good life. I mean, you might think that... Um, if you, that, for example, um, concerning the, um, the flourishing idea, you might think that the ultimate source of morality is, um, well, we're humans, and so we should be good, good humans, and that's going to include ethical duties, but it, uh, or the sort of, st the other regarding, uh, duties, but it also includes duties, uh, um, to develop our capacities. Um, or you might think, uh, for in the religious vein that, um, there is some sort of, I mean, so in the Christian tradition, it, it's not within your power to achieve divine grace, but to try to achieve it, to aim to achieve it, might arguably, at least in, in some context, be um, thought of as an ethical duty, or uh, attempting to achieve enlightenment. Although, in, in these religions, it's actually not obvious. I mean, some people, uh, it's generally uh, expected that... Um, not everybody is going to achieve uh, high levels of spiritual attainment um, in this life, um, whether or, or not there's an afterlife or rebirth or or nothing. Um, in so far as they allow for uh, spiritual um, attainments beyond this life, it may be that that's an appropriate place for at least some people to pursue them um, robustly. So. Whether or not there is indeed a moral duty per to pursue the good life, I think that people in our society are inclined to say that there's not, but, um, or at least the sort of the liberal parts of us are, but that's actually the point. I want to contrast two views, uh, liberalism and perfectionism. So liberalism is probably the view that um, most of you uh, have by default, even if you uh, think of yourself as a conservative um, Politically, it's likely that liberalism is here described, uh, you believe, although you, you might not. So liberalism is concerned with liberty. Autonomy is taken to be a fundamental value. By autonomy, we mean self-rule. Um, the ability to make one's own policies and act on them. So liberty is understood in terms of autonomy, and uh, we value liberty by respecting it and by respecting others' autonomy. That means that we don't interfere with their exercise of rational agency. So the idea is we're each rational in that we can choose our ends, we can determine the means for attaining those ends, and then um, execute those means. And being ethical is respecting others' rationality, especially by not interfering with the means, uh, uh, with the ends that they, with their choice of ends, with their choice of means, um, or with their actual, um, ex you know, uh, executing those means. So, I mean, I think that this is not necessarily left or right leaning. It's going to depend substantively on uh, how your notion of liberty and autonomy ends up getting cashed out. Uh, so, for example, um, one way we can think of freedom or liberty is, fr is as freedom from. So, if you have freedom from, and I'm going to contrast freedom from with freedom to, freedom from, well, means you're able to choose among various ends. You can choose among the means that are available. Um, you can decide which one is the best one, and then you can pursue uh, the ends by using those means. No one's going to stop you. So you're free from interference. You're free from being prevented uh, in acting in certain ways that are otherwise available to you. Now, to be freedom, having freedom from, it doesn't actually say what um, ends you're able to conceive. It doesn't say anything about how well you're able to think about those ends. It doesn't say what ends are possibly attainable for you. It doesn't say what kinds of means are available to you. It just says you're not going to be interfered with in your choice of uh, means and ends. Well, 
if liberty is understood as freedom from, then uh, that might support uh, a smaller government, and that uh, is oriented more towards a libertarian philosophy, which is certainly more of a right-wing philosophy, at least economically. So, if we think of liberalism in terms of uh, freedom from, then we might end up drifting more towards the right. Now, freedom too will be uh, somewhat familiar already from the uh, Nussbaum article and her focus on effective and substantial autonomy. So, freedom too is freedom to have and effectively exercise a variety of important capacities. Uh, Nussbaum actually has done a lot to develop what's called the capacities approach, which is a way of describing uh, social welfare. What and um, what we should be measuring when we're trying so when a society tries to um, tell how well it's doing uh, there are different measures you might look at so standardly people have looked at GNP gross national product just the amount of money the, the wealth uh, or the, the amount of money that the, that the society's goods are worth but um, that's not and so then the idea is well we should distribute uh, money equitably but that that uh, is not at all clear. It's not at all clear how strong a relationship there is between money and um, the things we actually value. Nussbaum, along with uh, Amartya Sen, who uh, recently won the Nobel Prize for Economics, have developed something called the capacities approach, where they say that what should be maximized, what we should think about when we're trying to figure out. Um, when we're aiming, when we're thinking about social policy, is that we should aim to maximize people's capacities to pursue their, uh, to, 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 to act autonomously, basically. Um, so Nussbaum's work has actually had a very significant impact um, in international um, development areas. But, so she has proposed the following list. Um, uh, this is just an example. But, so one freedom is the freedom to live. So this is just being able to live uh, a normal human uh, length life, not um, dying early. Bodily health is a part of, uh, is an important capacity, and that's going to include um, shelter, nourishment, reproductive health. Bodily integrity uh, includes not being assaulted, um, not being, um, being able to move around from place to place, having opportunities for sexual satisfaction and choice in matters of reproduction. There's the senses, senses, imagination, and thought, and this is going to be um, using the senses to imagine and think and reason, and to do so in a way that's um, truly human. In other words, it's not. It's sort of informed by the knowledge that we have uh, built up in human culture and being um, uh, informed by it and trained by it and being able to, to uh, use these abilities freely without um, interference, freedom from interference in this case. Um, freedom to have uh, emotional uh, connections to the things and people around us um, and not uh, being uh, oppressed by fear and anxiety that the environment might cause us. Um, being able to practically reason, which is the sort of autonomy I've been talking about, being able to uh, formulate a conception of one's ends and uh, to think about how to um, plan one's life to attain those ends. She talks about um, affiliation, which means being able to live in community with others and being able to live in community with others as an equal and respected member, um, not being humiliated, not being treated as uh, a second-class citizen. She talks about other species being able to live with concern for in relation to animals, plants, and the world of nature. Play, which is being able to engage in recreational activities and control over one's environment, and that will take both political and material forms. So all, taken all together, these capacities um, provide a picture of what a uh, human should have freedom to do. Um, what... Uh, what kinds of things uh, uh, a fully lived human life is going to involve and what sorts of freedoms are required in order to live that life. And so this is clearly um, uh, a much more demanding um, 
in some ways requirement or, or, or sort of um, condition them is freedom from because freedom from requires you to be free from interference. Freedom to requires you to have all these abilities to actually uh, exercise that freedom in particular substantive ways to bring about various, to actually bring about various states of affairs. Now it may be that liberty, if we think of liberty as freedom too, then we're going to have a larger government because the government is going to play a role in providing the uh, uh, capacities that we exercise to, um, in, in th that, we ex that are a necessary part of uh, having freedom to do all of these different things. And so this might uh, be um, the uh, sort of similar to the liberal side of the Democratic Party. So different conceptions of liberty, um, well, uh, or different conceptions of freedom um, are going to land you in different positions uh, on the political spectrum. And as we'll see, um, this notion of freedom, too, is going to, uh, um, one of the reasons I've talked about it is because it's going to continue to um, crop up in the course. So, but remember, we've been talking about um, whether or not, I, I've been talking about paternalism, uh, which is the sort of jumping off point from the article talked about um, how, uh, well, are there ethical duties beyond not harming others? And if there are, maybe they have to do with a good life. Um, and so now, thought, okay, well, so how should we understand um, uh, the moral status of pursuit of the good life? And liberalism is going to be one view that bears on um, on that question that answers how uh, we should understand moral pursuit of the good life and how we should understand the way in which one person can relate to another in uh, the la in the in interfering with or promoting the other's pursuit of the good life. So, so liberals uh, are going to understand the our other regarding duties mostly in terms of autonomy. They think it's wrong to interfere with others' autonomy, and they may think that it's right and sometimes required to promote it in various ways to um, sort of pr to to free people basically or to remove constraints on their autonomy. Um, in, um, an example being. Um, you know, saving someone from dying, where dying is sort of the ultimate destruction of one's autonomy. Now, the liberal is free to hold that there are important facts about the good life beyond the other regarding ethical duties. A liberal does not have to say that the good life just consists in happiness plus um, behaving ethically. Indeed, the liberal may hold that there is a that there is an objective fact about the good about what life is good, and there is a moral duty to pursue the good life. What's distinctive about liberalism is not that is not neutrality about the good life uh, as such. It's the claim that autonomy is more important than the good life. And that is how we get um, anti-paternalism dropping out of liberalism. The standard justification for a paternalist intervention is either to promote uh, the individual's well-being understood in terms of their good life or to promote their autonomy. Well, because the liberal thinks that autonomy um, outweighs the good life, the liberal thinks you should not violate autonomy uh, for the sake of uh, someone's pursuit of the good life. Um, so they might be doing things that are counterproductive, even from their own, um, either from what is the, if there is one, um, in terms of the objective facts about the good life, or if that's not the case, um, at least from their own conception of the good life, this person may be acting in counterproductive ways, but according to the liberal, the value of autonomy is more important than uh, whatever losses there might, um, whatever harms may be doing to this, the, whatever harm the individual may be doing to the prospect, their own prospects for a good life, and so the liberal will say, uh, don't intervene. Uh, for the sake of the good life. Again, um, there are ways in which you might act uh, in the short term in ways that are going to impinge upon your long-term autonomy. So, I mean, one example would just be drinking way too much. Um, it's going to destroy your ability to function as a, a free, rational, self-governing person. Well, um, but my respect for your current autonomy may prevent me from interfering with your heavy drinking that's going to damage your autonomy in the future. So, um, and these considerations about autonomy being more important than the good life constrain both the state and the individual in their interference and interaction with other people in their other lives. Um, you, in particular, you cannot coerce merely to prevent self-harm, and you cannot coerce merely to encourage self-help. So strong paternalism is false.
Weak paternalism is going to be okay. Remember, weak paternalism says if the individual's choice is not free, then we can intervene to, then we can coerce them if doing so would be better for them. Why is that? Well, if the individual's choice isn't free, then uh, autonomy is already uh, not on the table. It's already been violated. And so, given that the autonomy is already not, uh, that, that means that our intervention into the person's life wouldn't violate their autonomy because they're not exercising their autonomy anyway. And so then we can say, okay, now we can act to um, uh, promote the 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 good uh, uh, for this of this individual. Now, um, there's an issue about um, how strong the prohibition on interference is. In other words, so coercion is where there's a threat attached to uh, not doing what you want. The, you know, when the state coerces you or when uh, someone coerces you, they are threatening you with um, some sort of negative consequence if you don't act in the way that they um, want you to, but there are weaker forms of intervention, and um, it's less clear, uh, as I said, right, so sort of incentives, disincentives, uh, persuasion, and those are, are more legitimate because they uh, don't interfere with autonomy in the same way, although there are ways in which they can. So it, it's a more, del it's a delicate issue. What's fundamental is you don't, is a certain, um, is it violating other people's Autonomy, either on the part of the state or on the part of the individual, is for the most part out of bounds. That means coercion is out of bounds, and it may mean that some of the lesser forms, less um, aggressive and uh, powerful forms of uh, intervention are also out of bounds. It will depend upon um, the details of the case. So it's important, okay, so so far, so we've said, okay, that's the background for why Primaratz uh, is an anti-paternalist, and that's why he would say, um, if um, if prostitution did harm the prostitutes, which he doesn't think it does uh, in general, but if it did, we still wouldn't, the state wouldn't be justified in coercing the prostitutes um, to not engage in prostitution because they do so, at least not when they do so freely, because to do so would be to violate their autonomy even if they're damaging their uh, prospects for having a good life. But there's a different question about um, moral evaluation of other people's actions. So let's suppose that liberalism is true, that um, autonomy is a very important ethical value that both the state and individuals need to respect, and consequently that uh, the state and individuals cannot uh, violate others' autonomy in attempting to promote the, the good life for those individuals. What about making moral judgments about other people's activities? Uh, what about we have someone who uh, is doing something, it's not harming another person. We're not going to coerce them. We're not going to violate their autonomy by actually intervening in their lives in a, in, a, in a coercive way or in a threatening way. But what about making judgments about uh, the morality of their activities that don't harm others? What does liberalism have to say about that? Liberalism and anti-paternalism say that it's okay. It does not follow that we shouldn't make moral judgments. It doesn't follow, should one not make moral judgments about others' activities? No, uh, w one can. Anti-paternalism is about action. It's about uh, action including speech, but um, it says you, uh, the observer, can't uh, act on the other person in certain ways. But it's not a doctrine about what goes on in your head. It's not a doctrine about judgment. It says you can. It doesn't say you can't or shouldn't form judgment about others beyond the autonomy relevant features of their actions. It says you can't coercively intervene in their lives on the basis of such judgments. So, um, being respectful of other people's autonomy and liberty and of their freedom to live their own lives is perfectly consistent with making judgments about the moral status of their actions even where uh, we're not concerned with the effects of their actions on others or their relations with others. But, uh, and the reason that that's so is liberalism says don't interfere, but the judgment doesn't require, making it a judgment of this sort doesn't require that you interfere. So, 
and in fact, liberalism in the good life, so liberalism is compatible with, with different claims about the good life. It's compatible with the claim that there is no general fact about what the good life is. So in that case, each individual would judge what is best for him or herself. That judgment would, by definition, be correct. Or there is a general fact about what the good life is. That's also compatible with liberalism. But liberalism, will, in that case, would say that it's hard to know what the good life is. Each individual has the ability to formulate a rational answer to that question. And out of our respect for those other people's abilities, uh, we don't intervene coercively in their lives. They may be, it's, but it's still possible that they're right or wrong in their conception of the good life, or that your conception of the good life is right or wrong. Being a liberal in this sense and having lots of respect for other people's autonomy requires that you not coerce them. It requires that you not um, prevent them from rationally pursuing their own ends and means, and that you uh, arguably be supportive of uh, their um, having access to the capacities to actually pursue a rich, effectively pursue a rich set of um, ends. But that's all compatible with there being facts about this is a good life, this is not a good life, this person is doing a good job of uh, of pursuing the good life, this person is not, and it's even compatible with those being moral duties, and it's compatible with you making judgments about all of those things. It's just that you can't intervene in their life. You have to respect them. So it's okay to make judgments about other people's private activities. You're, when you make that judgment, you're not committed to doing anything in particular to them. Now, you don't want to, this would include, um, you, sh you wouldn't shun them. Um, you wouldn't uh, ostracize them uh, for those sorts of decisions because that arguably might be some sort of coercive intervention um, if, the, if that sort of social pressure was sufficiently widespread anyway. Um, it also means, it's important to remember, that it's okay for others to make moral judgments about your uh, private activities. But what's not okay is for individuals to impose those judgments on each other in coercive fashion. Okay? So this means that we can ask all sorts of questions about moral issues while being liberal in this sense and being respectful of others' uh, autonomy. We can ask, um, is an action ethically required as an other regarding duty? That's entirely unproblematic. We can ask, is an action part of the good life? Now that typical, typically will be a complicated issue because to figure out whether or not an action is part of the good life, we'll need a conception of the good life, and then we'll also need to look at the person's particular situation and see, well, how does this contribute to their pursuit of the good life? And the same kind of action may, in, in, for people in different situations, in one situation, promote the good life and another detract from the good life. That's what we'll see later with um, some examples of prostitution, in fact. We have to consider the, the situation of the agent and so forth. We can ask, is a given action ethically required as part of the good life? We can ask, is any third party intervention permissible and required? We can ask, is paternalistic intervention permissible or required? So, the point of all this is to say, um, first of all, we've uh, talked about a justification for these um, anti paternalist doctrines, namely uh, liberalism, and in particular its respect for. Um, its claim that autonomy is very valuable and that it needs to be respected by both states and individuals. And we've seen, I think, also that that respect is entirely compatible with there being facts about what the good life is, um, where those facts run far beyond um, what is ethically uh, required in terms of one's respecting other people's autonomy, and that respecting other people's autonomy is perfectly compatible with concluding that they're wrong. If you think that but it's not compatible with denigrating them or coercing or coercing them. So uh, it's very important to distinguish between having a judgment that says this person's conception of the good life is wrong and thinking I don't respect them um, and they're uh, stupid or uh, a second-class citizen or they should be coerced uh, into pursuing my conception of the good life. All of those things... Uh, you don't do, but you don't have to do any of those things just because you think that someone has made a mistake in deciding what the good life is. Okay, so um, talked about anti-paternalism, talked about liberalism, talked about liberalism both sort of in the context of um, how we should understand uh, what it 
says for political and um, moral disputes sort of independently of our particular concerns. Um, talked about different conceptions of freedom that lead you to rather different conceptions of liberty and different political positions. Talked about how um, respect for autonomy is compatible with um, believing that there are facts about the good life, that other people are getting them wrong, um, but that it's not compatible with um, treating those people badly uh, as a result of, the, of your judgments about the good life. Okay. Now, before getting back to the prostitution, there's just one more issue that I need to discuss, um, which is perfectionism. So perfectionism is an alternative to liberalism, and the reason I'm going to talk about it is that this terminology is used in the Uraco article, which is the next reading. Okay, so perfectionism is generally presented as an alternative to liberalism. It, it's a somewhat um, involved doctrine about uh, the ethical significance of the good life, and I'm going to sort of work up to uh, a complete statement of it. Once I've gotten there, I'll say, okay, now we have stated the whole view, but I'm not going to get there right away. So the first idea is that there is, in fact, an objective good life. Um, it might be determined by human nature. It might be determined by other objective considerations. Now, perfectionism is not a theory about which conception of the good life is actually correct. Um, so there's, as we'll see, um, perfectionism, there's a, perf uh, a variety of perfectionism that would go with um, Christianity. There's a variety of perfectionism that would go with Buddhism. There's a variety of perfectionism that would go with the sort of um, human flourishing picture of the good life. Perfectionism is as we'll see, a way of um, understa about understanding the ethical significance of the good life, um, whatever the actual good life turns out to be. Now, the uh, perfectionist thinks that um, what is important, one thing that's important, is that the good facts about the good life um, go um, beyond the straightforward other regarding duties. Uh, in other words, there's much more to living the good life than uh, fulfilling your other respecting duties. Now, so far, this is compatible with liberalism. Um, but where uh, perfectionism uh, starts to contradict with liberalism is that ethical duties are understood at least in part in terms of promoting perfection one's own and others, whether or not that perfection be human flourishing or uh, achieving a state of divine grace or whatever uh, else the conception of the good life says is the good life. And so um, political aims and means are going to be understood in terms of promoting perfections of the citizens. So if you have a religious perfectionism, then that's going to aim uh, to, then the political structure is going to be set up to um, uh, facilitate people's achieving the, the ends that that religion's conception of the good life says are the important ones. So, um, so perfectionism does not respect autonomy in the way that liberalism does. Perfectionism will allow that uh, will allow for paternalistic intervention, where doing so would promote the relevant cons would, would promote the relevant kind of good life. Um, if it's a human flourishing conception of the good life, then uh, perfectionism about that would say it's okay to violate human autonomy or to violate autonomy if it promotes human flourishing. So where perfectionism and liberalism disagree is um, that their relative weighting of autonomy and the good life. And the perfectionist says that the good life is more important than autonomy, and the liberal says that autonomy is more important than the good life. And so they have different conclusions about paternalism. The liberalism says paternalism is has to be s severely restricted, whereas um, b because paternalism would violate autonomy, and autonomy is more important than the good life, whereas the perfectionist says uh, the good life, whichever whichever kind of good life the perfectionist thinks is in fact the good life, they say that's the good life and it's more important than um, than autonomy in at least some cases and so it can violate people's autonomy. And you could have a liberal and, and a, a, a liberals and perfectionists could agree about a given conception of the good life. What they disagree, so they could both agree, yes, like so they could both say, you know, this version of Christianity is the correct specification of the good life, um, of the full good life and sort of uh, what the relation with it's, there's a specific relation kind of relationship with God that is um, what the good life finally consists in and here's how it's to be realized and they agree on that but then the liberal and the perfectionist who agree on that um, disagree on how autonomy and uh, the promotion of that relationship with divinity um, 
are to be weighed in one's actions. And the liberal says um, that uh, you have to respect other people's autonomy and you can't violate their autonomy in trying to get them to be in this uh, special relationship with divinity, whereas the perfectionist says, no, it's okay. Um, the relationship with the appropriate relationship with divinity is more important than autonomy, and so if you could push someone in that direction by violating their autonomy, that very well might be okay. And um, they might instead, but you, and, and the same sort of um, Dispute could be articulated with any other conception of the good life, like a human flourishing conception of the good life. Now, there is uh, some gray area um, between liberalism and perfectionism because they, in fact, can both value autonomy in very similar ways. Um, on the one hand, um, the perfectionist might value autonomy because um, they might think that being rational and autonomous is uh, a central perfection. It's a very important perfection. And so um, while uh, it doesn't necessarily have an independent, uh, the independent status as a value that the liberal thinks it does, it is important as part of a perfect life. Remember that when I was talking about the human flourishing notion of a human life, rationality uh, was the first thing that I mentioned. On the other hand, um, the liberal might think, look, if you are rational and autonomous, then hopefully you're, in fact, going to pursue perfection. Um, and so you will... Uh, uh, and so the, the liberal and the... Um, and the perfectionists can agree that autonomy is quite important in pursuit of the good life and of great ethical significance, even though they um, might they, they have a somewhat different explanation for why it has the importance that it does. Now, there is a question about autonomy to do what? The perfectionist thinks that autonomy is going to be important insofar as it's autonomy to live the good life. And so they might think that autonomy is only important insofar as it plays a role in one's pursuit of the good life. Um, whereas the liberal says what's important is that autonomy allows you to choose and uh, um, a conception of the good life and follow that. Um, that may require a rich account of autonomy. It may require um, advocation, uh, advocacy of freedom to as opposed to freedom from, but it doesn't presume any particular conception of the good life. Now, this is important. Why? It doesn't show up in the Primer Rats article. It's important because of the Iraqo article. The Iraqo article um, announces that uh, she's going to be perfectionist, and she's going to defend, a perf uh, explain certain uh, why certain laws are structured as they are by appealing to a perfectionist theory as opposed to a liberal theory. But in fact, it's possible that the liberal could just as well account for the um, could say. Uh, Iraqo says we need to have a certain laws to preserve certain features of um, human peop uh, of, of humans, um, uh, uh, certain capacities, and the perfectionist says uh, they're important because they're part of a uh, particular conception of the good life, and the liberal says they're important because they're uh, an important part of autonomy. So I'll come back to that at the end um, to say a little bit more about, uh, you know, write that out a little bit about how... Um, the liberalism and perfectionism interact with respect to the Iraqo article. Um, I wanted to discuss perfectionism now because um, it's the it's a, it contradicts liberalism, and we were discussing liberalism because it had to do with paternalism and because it has to do with uh, the sort of status of our own moral judgments. Okay, fantastic. So now uh, we can move on with the actual discussion of prostitution. So um, the first point that Primer Rats discusses is the idea that some things are just not for sale. And of course, he's not sympathetic to the idea that uh, sex is one of those things. So what is the idea that some things are just not for sale? Well, the thought is there are different spheres of human activity, and these different spheres have different principles of action. So there are the personal relationships, there are competitions, there's the political sphere, there's the religious sphere, there's the market. And the thought is that these have different principles of action, and uh, we shouldn't, either we cannot or should not bring the market into some of these other spheres. So, for example, um, it may be literally impossible to buy friendship. Why is that? Well, friendship requires liking the person, genuine friendship. So, I uh, can't just choose to like a person. Um, 
in the way that I can move, choose to move my body around, right? It's there's no issue in sort of unless I'm chained down and my muscles aren't working. I want to raise my arm, and I do. Um, but I want to uh, like uh, person X or Y or Z. Well, um, that's not something that I can just choose to do in the same way. But to sell my um, to sell my friendship to somebody, I would need to be able to choose it in that way. But I can't um, choose it, and so I can't sell it, and so it can't be bought. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, someone else might spend their money in various ways to cause me to like them, right? They may uh, take me out to fancy parties and fancy dinners and buy me lots of nice gifts and so on. And as a result of doing so, um, I may come to actually, I mean, I may find being around the person pleasant because of the benefits I get. But I may even actually like come to like them uh, and think of them as a friend um, because the gifts that they have bought me um, have obscured my ability to, well, ha let's say, have influenced my assessment of the person's character so that their character um, appears uh, to me to be good, and that's why I like them. Um, whether or not their character is good um, might be a further question, so that the money, all the goods that they purchase, um, basically what they're doing is creating an illusion about their character by buying all these things, uh, by, by spending money to benefit me. Um, so that, that there are certainly indirect ways uh, to use money to acquire friendship, but I don't think it's literally something that can be bought and sold. Again, there's the idea that you should not buy political office. Uh, why is that? Well, because we think that individuals, all the different individuals in our society should have an equal political say, uh, and that the, their sort of access and in to an influence on the political system should be equal uh, however much money they have. And that means that you shouldn't be able to buy a political office, because if you could, then you would have more power than someone, more political power than someone who was less uh, wealthy than you. And we think that's bad. Or at least, if you think that's bad, then you think political office shouldn't be purchasable. So, that general idea is applied to sexuality, and the idea is that sexuality is not for sale. And um, to make out this, to, to defend the claim that sexuality is not for sale, you need to say what sex is to explain why it is not the kind of thing it can be bought or sold, or should be bought or sold, right, as I just discussed. I said a little bit about, in explaining why friendship cannot literally be uh, bought, I appealed to a fact about what friendship is. It's liking the person for who they are, and a fact about psychology, about how we come to like someone for who they are. And in talking about the political office, I talked about what it is about political offices and political equality and so forth that um, explains why we think you shouldn't be able to buy political office. So similarly, we're going to have conceptions of sex, according to which um, supposedly... Uh, Sex is not for sale. So the first is a certain religious conception um, promulgated by, um, well, it's certainly part of Christianity. Uh, this is uh, painted by Caravaggio showing uh, Saul, the tax collector, uh, falling off his horse uh, in a beam of light and being converted. He changes his name to St. Paul. Um, St. Paul is one of the major um, figures in the history of Christianity who argues that sex is bad. Um, St. Augustine of Hippo is another um, thing that sex, the activity, the desire, the pleasure, is, is bad and wrong. Now, they do think that the benefits of procreation outweigh the costs, although there were some um, sects that didn't um, agree with that, but unsurprisingly, they didn't last very long. Um, but as, as, as Primarats points out, um, Augustine says it would be better if... Uh, we did not desire sex, and sex did not cause pleasure, and it was just sort of a purely reproductive um, bodily function. Um, but uh, nonetheless, it does, and we can have sex for procreative, So, but it's okay to have sex for procreative purposes. Um, because the benefits of procreation do outweigh those costs, and the best place for having sex for procreative purposes is within the family. So, um, if you think that sex is bad, then you uh, and you think it's only legitimate when it's procreative, then you're think going to think that sex should not be purchased. Now, uh, there it is notable that Augustine actually was an advocate of prostitution because he thought that it helped to dissipate male lust, and so. And, and other religious figures have felt the same. So religion actually has a somewhat equivocal, or this sort of the religious 
if you you can have a, a religious conception according to which sex is bad and at the same time think that prostitution should be legal because of the effects that it would have um, in much the same way that uh, marital sex has good effects, namely procreation. Um, whether or not that's hypocritical of the of a religious whether or not that's a hypocritical religious view or a, a hypocritical view is uh, an issue that I just I don't think is really worth getting into. Um, what I do think is worth pointing out is that I think that this religious conception of sex is false. Uh, in my view, sex is not intrinsically morally bad. Um, certainly, sex can get caught up in bad practices, rape, harassment, and an ability to relate to others on a personal level and to see them only as sexual objects. But none of these are moral criticisms of sex as such. They're claims that um, sex can, and sexual activity, sexual desire, can have negative effects when coupled with other things or put in certain situations. But they don't say that sex is in and of itself a bad thing. That not doesn't say the sex, that sexual activity is bad, and doesn't say that sexual desire is bad, and it doesn't say that sexual pleasure is bad. Now, there may be this kernel of truth. It may be that lots of sexual activity, lots of f uh, focus on satisfying sexual desire, um, lots of focus on sexual pleasure may distract one and interfere with more important elements uh, of the good life. That certainly um, is, is at least a plausible claim. Um, but uh, the claim that sex is intrinsically morally bad, well, some of you may believe that. Um, and if you do, uh, I'm not going to try to... Um, argue you out of it, but I would just ask, ask you to consider why you believe that. So let's turn to the, and, and oh, let me say, I should add, um, I mean, Primarats, I think, very clearly thinks that that, that this religious conception is just false. Um, oh, and I should say, it, this is not to say that all religion is wrong, and it's not even to say that everything that, re everything that, r every religious thing that's been said about sex is bad, it's just to say, or is, is mistaken, it's to say that a certain view that one finds in religion that says it's sex in some, uh, parts of Christianity and some parts of other religions, um, that holds, it's that, that element of those religions holds that sex is intrinsically morally bad. And if that element were correct, then prostitution would be at least problematic, but it's very unclear why uh, that element uh, should be correct. But that doesn't mean there are other, uh, a variety of other religious things, uh, to a variety of other things that different religions say about sexuality. So it's not a dismissal of all religion or of all, everything that religion has to say about sexuality. Okay, that said, let's move on to the romantic conception. So first, just um, a piece of terminology. We'll say that plain sex is sex without love, and romantic sex is sex with love. And I might sometimes say loving sex instead. Okay, so the romantic conception tells us that um, sex is an integral part of a fully integrated, realized, loving relationship. It allows for contact of minds at a very, very deep level, um, and a very intimate level, and involves some sort of self, uh, involves awareness of the other person. Um, and we'll see, actually, Thomas Nagel in his article on sexual perversion has things to say about this that I think are, are uh, interesting and provocative. In any case, um, plain sex, on the other hand, uh, according to the romantic conception, is just animal. Um, that's something in, in, this, in this straightforward sense. Um, animals can have sex, uh, and some of the reason they might be driven to have sex, at least some of them, is because it's pleasant, um, pleasurable, uh, but um, animals lack the ability to use sex as a vehicle for um, intimacy and partnering with a romantic partner. And so um, while romantic sex is a distinctively human um, uh, uh, activity, plain sex is not. And this means that plain sex is not as good as romantic sex on the romantic conception. Now. There's a bad argument from the romantic conception against prostitution. So it says, plain sex is worse than romantic sex, therefore plain sex is bad. Now, if that were the case, then we might think, okay, um, there's something wrong with prostitution. It's using sexuality in a bad way because it's not done in this as part of this loving relationship. However, um, the therefore just uh, doesn't follow. Um, all we know is that plain sex is just not as good. That doesn't mean it's bad, just as... Um, a you know, 
of a grain of, of B is not as good as a grain, uh, or, or, or let's forget that, an A is not a good, uh, is not as good of a grade as an A+, plus. nonetheless, an A is still a good grade, right? So, um, when you have a scale of things that are good and bad, if you say one, one thing is good and something else is worse than that, where, well, how much worse than that? Um, and, and where does that place the second thing that's not as good? Is it, in fact, bad, or is it just not as good? So, and Primer Arts makes these points, I think, correctly. But then, I think he sort of, um, he says, so that romantic opponents of prostitution need an argument that having plain sex actually interferes with having romantic sex. So it's not just that plain sex is not as good, it's that it damages the good sex. And so they would say, having plain sex destroys the ability to have romantic sex. Um, I mean, the, the basic thought here is that um, if you have lots of plain sex, then you come to think of having... Um, then you come to conceive and experience sex just in terms of plain sex, and so when the opportunity presents itself to have romantic sex, you don't uh, sort of act on it because it's not, uh, you've somehow lost the uh, ability to conceive of or to think of or to react um, to that opportunity as a romantic opportunity. It only seems to you to uh, be an opportunity for more pleasure. That would be the idea. But Premarat says this is false. There are lots of people who have lots of plain sex and then go on to have a very rich, uh, loving, um, romantic sex with a partner. So, and I think that that's true. Um, having plain sex does not necessarily destroy the ability to have romantic sex. It, it, now, but that's not to say that plain sex never damages the ability to have romantic sex, only to say that um, in many cases it need not and does not, and indeed it may... Um, uh, insofar as the pleasurable elements of sex are important to the uh, to romantic sex, having lots of plain sex may, in fact, um, uh, contribute to one's ability to have uh, intimate romantic sex at another time. But there's a better argument from the romantic conception against prostitution. Um, that uh, I don't this. What Pramarats is doing at the p this point is confusing, and I don't understand why he doesn't discuss it. So, according to Pramarats, the romantic uh, opponent of prostitution has to hold that all plain sex is bad. This is wrong. This is just not true. Prostitution involves a distinctive kind of plain sex. It involves commercial plain sex. And so the opponent of prostitution can say, no, look, maybe plain sex in general is not particularly damaging uh, to the ability to have romantic sex. But commercial plain sex is worse than, um, than plain plain sex. And in fact, commercial plain sex is damaging. So... Um, that claim uh, would need to be defended. The claim, commercial plane, the, so consider, does commercial plane sex damage the ability to have romantic sex? Well, um, it, if the opponent of prostitution would need to argue for that claim, but um, it, they might very well be able to, and they would not be committed to the claim that all plane sex is damaging, um, unlike... Um, what Primarat says. So I think that this part of his discussion is just mistaken. And indeed, what's particularly bizarre is that earlier on in the article, in the discussion of prostitution, Primarat grants that, um, that prostitutes damage their uh, ability to have sex. And it seems like um, it, what he's saying is that having commercial plain sex, uh, the, the prostitutes having commercial sex, damages their ability to have romantic sex. Now, he may be granting that, just for the sake of argument, uh, in reply to the paternalist, and in fact think that no, having lots of commercial plain sex does not damage the ability to have romantic sex. Um, so he may, in fact, not be granting this premise, but nonetheless he's at least considering it elsewhere. And so I find it very strange that he doesn't, um, in the discussion of some things are not just for sale, um, why he doesn't consider the possibility that the opponent of prostitution would argue just that commercial plain sex is bad. So, okay, the idea would be that over time, commercial plain sex damages the ability of both the prostitute and the client to have loving sex. Why might that be? Well, one th might, thing might have to do with integrity. In commercial plain sex, the prostitute arguably has to simulate attraction and arousal. Perhaps they have to simulate affection for the client. And th in 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 the prostitute and the client in being exposed to or in practicing this deception repeatedly could, you might think, lose the ability to actually trust the signs of attraction and arousal and affection because they are so often um, uh, 
exposed to those signs when they know that they do not really accompany the attraction and arousal and affection, and so they don't trust them anymore. In a way, we're talking about the boy who cried wolf, right? Um, when they are in the opportunity to have the uh, you know romantic sex, um, they the signs uh, that their partner um, is truly attracted to them, aroused by them, affect and, and has affection for them, um, the prostitute or the client or the sort of regular client of the prostitute, those signs of um, manifestations of affection, signs of attraction and arousal um, may not be, I mean, some signs of arousal, yes, okay, fine, but um, they may not indicate anything particularly loving um, uh, on the part of the partner. There's also the possibility um, of uh, habituation. So the thought would be that commercialized plain sex is particularly lacking in, in bona fide intimacy. It doesn't actually have real intimacy. And so perhaps uh, repeatedly engaging in commercialized plain sex would lead one to view all sex as not involving intimacy or love. Just simply because you have um, so many experiences of sex that are one way, you might end up sort of thinking of sex in, in that way. And so it seems like it's possible that commercial plain sex could be damaging. Now, it's not, however, entirely clear what the upshot of if I'm right that commercial, well, I'm not sure uh, to what degree commercial plain sex uh, is damaging of the ability to have romantic sex. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not entirely certain how much of the romantic conception of love and sex I buy, and I think it's an empirical question. It has to do with human psychology about whether or not um, having lots of commercial plain sex would damage one's ability to um, have romantic sex. Um, one might be able to compartmentalize them very effectively and say, look, I can very easily distinguish between commercial plain sex and romantic sex. All the in encounters I had with the prostitute, I know what those were. They were commercial plain sex, and so I shouldn't uh, transfer lessons from them, uh, learn w sort of learn from them over to uh, sex with my loving partner because the relationship is just so obviously different. And and it, 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 the prostitute may be able to do the same thing um, with respect to her, um, the people she loves outside of her, her work and her clients. Um, and, and so it, I take it that it's an empirical question about human psychology, uh, how it's structured. It might be that that sort of compartmentalization is possible, and it might not be. So it's a contingent question, and it will require investigation. So they may not be true, as I've said. Even if it is true that um, commercial plain sex damages morality, uh, damages um, romantic, the ability to have romantic sex, that doesn't necessarily get us to immorality or unethicality. Um, y so um, you might think, okay, yes, um, the ability to have uh, romantic sex is going to be an important... Let's suppose that you were a perfect perfectionist and your conception of the good life included ha being able to and actually having romantic sex. And then you say, okay, the prostitute has damaged, uh, severely damaged her ability to have romantic sex, and so she's severely damaged her ability to do one of the things that's an important part of having the good life. Does it follow that the prostitute has done something unethical and immoral? Now, we're remembering, uh, if you're liberal, you, you would say, well, no. Uh, but even if you were a perfectionist, you wouldn't necessarily say yes. And the perfectionist says you should do whatever you can to realize the good life. But if the prostitute is in a bad position, um, it might be that um, she, the of the career options that are available to her. Uh, the prostitution, uh, being a prostitute, is by far uh, more lucrative, and that the money that she gets from prostitution allows her to pursue uh, the good life in all sorts of other ways, ways that outweigh the um, damage that is done to her ability to have romantic sex. And so even if we grant that commercial plain sex damages um, the ability to have romantic sex, and we say that... Uh, you should do your best to pursue the good life. We still don't get at the conclusion that um, gets at the conclusion that prostitution is wrong because we have to consider what are the options that are available to the prostitute. Maybe uh, the costs that the prostitute suffers to uh, their ability to live the good life by not being able to have romantic sex are outweighed by the benefits that they um, obtain by. Um, 
on the one hand, the money, and then also there's the question of what are the costs of the other of the alternatives to the to prostitution for the prostitute. So, for someone in a non-ideal situation, prostitution could be part of a committed pursuit of the good life. And this is a point that uh, Nussbaum makes when she is discussing uh, Elizabeth Anderson. So, I think that um, Primerats does not uh, definitively establish that. Um, some things are not just for sale, but um, I don't think that there's a very strong argument for the um, immorality of prostitution from it. I at best, you I you can say there's an empirical and claim about human psychology um, that we could use to say that certain people should not be prostitutes because they would have much better options to per that, that that they have lots of options uh, that uh, would allow them to better pursue the good life. But um, that's a pretty limited claim. Uh, it's explicitly um, r relies on um, a claim about human psychology that needs empirical verification. The claim being that sort of um, the effects of commercial plain sex cannot be compartmentalized from the ability to have romantic sex, and um, it only applies to prostitutes who have lots of other options. So, okay, so th there may be something there. Let's move on to the next argument, which is uh, the argument from feminism. So, I should just say, first of all, a word about feminism. Um, one thing is to note that there are many, many different varieties, and uh, this makes it difficult to define feminism because uh, you have to find a common core. Um, so a possible common core is as follows. The, the first, a descriptive claim. Women and those who appear to be women are subjected to wrongs and or injustice, at least in part because they are or appear to be women. And a normative claim that the wrongs and injustices that women suffer because they are women or appear to be women ought not to occur. They should be stopped when and where they do. Okay, now in these terms, I certainly count myself as a feminist. Um, now, I mean, I, I, and, and I'm actually so, sort of somewhat mystified by the fact that um, uh, so many people are, uh, sort of feminism has such a bad name um, because, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, it, mm, whatever. Um, that's my view, and I just wanted to put that out there, and I think it's important that one see uh, what feminism claims. Um, now, that said, you wouldn't have to be a feminist to believe that prostitution involved degradation or oppression, and that prostitution is therefore unethical. So the discussion that I'm going to go into about whether or not prostitution involves the degradation of the prostitute or involves uh, contributes to oppression of women, um, one might think, look, those are bad, um, even while not agreeing uh, to the, s the descriptive and the normative claim here that I've um, uh, laid out as a being a possible core of feminism. I would add, uh, I should say, that uh, these two claims uh, at, as defining a possible common core of feminism uh, come from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry on feminism, um, which if you are, uh, well, it, it's, a, it's, it's a fairly rich article, which you might want to check out if this interests you. Okay, so let's move on to the degradation issue. So just to be clear, we want to say what degradation is. So what is degradation? It's going to be loss of self-respect, loss of a sense of one's own dignity, the loss of respect and dignity in the eyes of others, and a loss of autonomy. And that might be um, either um, uh, freedom to, in the sense that one is going to lose the ability to do uh, various things that are important uh, that that, uh, rel that that allow one to achieve important human ends, or it might be that one loses the ability to rationally assess ends or to choose um, means of pursuing them. So, um, so that that that's the these are the sorts of things when we say that prostitution uh, may be degrading. This is what uh, we're talking about. Um, I should. Uh, Parenthetically, say that some sex acts probably are degrading, but that's facts about the sex acts and not about prostitution itself. Um, when we think about these issues, we need to be clear uh, about uh, what we're thinking about. So, if you think of a prostitute performing certain sex acts, you can say, "Oh, prostitution is degrading," but um, no, because the prostitute doesn't have to perform those sex acts. Okay, so. So Primeratz identifies four different conditions that he thinks one might claim to grade a prostitute. One is that the prostitute-client relationship is impersonal. Two is that the prostitute is used merely as a means to the client's ends and is not treated as an end in herself. 
Three is that the prostitute performs intimate acts for money. And four is that the prostitute sells her body and herself. And so um, uh, Primarat is going to argue that um, the prostitute-client relationship may be immoral and that the prostitute indeed does perform intimate acts for money, but those are not degrading. And he's going to argue that the prostitute does not sell her body and herself, that it might be degrading to sell your body and yourself, but the prostitute does not do that. Again, it might be degrading to be used merely as a means to the client's ends, but that doesn't, that's not what happens in prostitution. So um, I'm going to argue that things are... Um, more complicated than uh, Primarat's uh, lays out once we uh, allow for the distinction between freedom from and freedom to. What I'm going to um, suggest is that in at least certain cases, while um, consensual prostitution is clearly compatible with freedom from, and uh, it may not be so compatible with freedom to. So we'll get to that. So impersonality first. So this is just the fact that the um, uh, people in the interaction are not particularly interested in the personal characteristics of the people that they're interacting with. Now, as Primarats points out, many relationships are impersonal but not degrading, and this means that impersonality uh, by itself does not lead to degradation. Um, this means if impersonality is relevant to degradation, it has to be impersonality plus something else that leads to degradation, where um, presumably the something else is sex. So if you thought that sex should always be personal, then you could conclude that um, sex... Uh, the prostitution would involve something that should not happen. Now, even if you thought that, it doesn't necessarily get you exactly to degradation. Um, uh, for one thing, it doesn't. We don't get the specification of who is degraded in the impersonal relationship. Um, I mean, because neither the client nor the prostitute treats the other as a person necessarily. And the sale of sex is consensual. So um, we have two people uh, who are maybe not treating either really care uh, about the, the personal characteristics of the other person at all. Um, and so there's impersonality on both sides. Now, it's true that the client is... Um, has more control in the situation, um, but the prostitute, again, remember, is consenting to that, and um, and it's not clear, again, why how that would link up with the sort of the the bad impersonality to result in degradation. Um, it's just I think that impersonality by itself just is not a problem. Um, uh, it's very hard to uh, get to the conclusion that. Um, there's degradation involved just because of impersonality. In fact, I think it's because sex I is in certain ways inevitably personal that it might be degrading. Um, so as he points out, in addition, there's not an argument that sex should always be personal, that sex should always involve appreciation of the other person's personality. Okay, what about the second argument, the mere means argument? So to talk about this, we need to have a general discussion of means and ends um, in order to see what the issue here is. So what are ends? I've been using this phrase a lot, and I think it's fairly clear, but just I want to be uh, explicit. So an action's end, well, it's the value that the action is intended to promote or respect or that otherwise makes the action worth doing. Um, so the end of an action might be bringing something about, like uh, bringing about pleasure or happiness or removing pain. It might be uh, the end of an action might be that the action is in and of itself worthwhile. It might be that the action in and of itself uh, is required to respect someone's autonomy, um, so not lying to someone. For example, it's not that there's any particular effect uh, that you're trying to bring about um, by not lying. It's that uh, not lying in and of itself uh, is a way of respecting um, someone else's autonomy, and lying is in and of itself a way of violating someone's autonomy. Okay, so our ultimate ends are valuable in and of themselves without reference to anything else that's valuable. Um, their, their value is not explained in terms of the relation to something else of value. A means, on the other hand, is something just that brings about an end. And so what a means can be is, well, uh, almost anything, right? Uh, a trip to the dentist, exercise, watching TV, um, are all means to possible ends. Um, and what uh, a given means uh, will be an end to depends upon the environment. Um, so what, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, exercising um, in, uh, you know, 130 degree weather is a means to uh, damaging your body, whereas exercising in, you know, 75 degree weather is not. It might be a means to, um, to helping your body. 
Okay, okay. So, so we use each other, other, other as a moment of time, time, time cooperation ratio and ratio and for example. So, so let's suppose you use you have a cooperating study, 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 test, 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 uh, uh, so let's so use the responsibility for, for, for uh, uh, you know, learning, learning, learning some parts of the material really well, really well, the responsibility for learning other parts of the materials really well, really well. you're each using each other to learn, learn, um, another part of the material really well, really well. Or, or payment, payment, um, you and the, Circular clerk, clerk are uh, using, uh, using each other. You were using, you were using clerk, clerk, clerk to, uh, uh, to get to get to get to get um, uh, good, 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 and the clerk, and the clerk is, is using you and some cash. cash. Uh, uh, or or you persuade persuade to do something. Do something. You are you are using means, 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 means to you know there's so there's some reason why why there may be some reason why why there's some reason why you want to do what what you're persuading them to do. And so so your persuasion is is to get to get to bring value out in that you want to want, and that's there for their function again. Me and that end for you. But there's nothing wrong with using, using someone as someone who is compatible with the perspective of an end. And the case, the case that I just described, that's an action that's actually highly free, 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 right? We don't we don't coerce the partner of cooperation or in payment or in persuasion. We don't we don't coerce the partner of their views and views of ends. That means we respect respect their autonomy and their actions and we don't violate their autonomy. That's part of the reason we're using it as a person. Money, money is an effect that violates. Now, we respect your 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 we need to distinguish between that people, 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 people in the case, case, case of un un coercion, we, we do not we do not treat people as ends. We violate violate our autonomy. Um, 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 and and their autonomy is not something we need to promote or promote or respect and their autonomy is therefore not one of our ends. This means this means we can distinguish between treating treating someone both as a means to our to our end but also as an as an end and treating treating someone merely as a means as means former is good is good the latter latter is bad bad the former is a former is a quasi quasi the latter the latter is so, so, in, in, it's, it's obvious, obvious that, that the process of client client uses the process of using the process of using the process of using the process of the process of using the process of using the process of using the process of using the process the question is, 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 is either of using the process of using the process of using the process of using the process of using the the process of using 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 the process um, um, the client client who are not do not use the process merely merely as a means for means pleasure. Why, why not? Why not? Because because this is just another just another cooperation. The process of the sense sense she exercises her autonomy on the issue of her sense. Her sense is good. Her 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 ends of making money money, which is up to a certain point a totally totally respectable end. So so the client may have may have interest interest in the process. He may care very care very much about the process. That just that just makes the client tower. Doesn't make doesn't make the client the client client is buying buying. Uh, uh, the the cost of the um, um, and so and so not treating not treating the her merely as a means, means. Or so it so it seems. Seem. Um, um, I don't think I don't think the actually, actually fully established establishes, fully establishes, establishes that the process is treated as an end client. client. So, so certainly, certainly if, if, if we think in terms of freedom, freedom from, freedom from, 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 from um, then, then the process clearly retains retains autonomy because, autonomy because, autonomy because, because um, um, and is not treated not treated as a means to an end. To an end because she she chooses her end. She chooses to means to mean what what she thinks would be would be the best the best to take those ends and then and then carries the out out and 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 so so client. Respects the respects the client, the client respects the experience, the coercion, the coercion, the from coercion, the coercion, the client, the client, the worst, the worst, the, 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 the cross, cross, help, 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 help. Um, um, what about, what about freedom, freedom, too? Well, well, it's not, it's not clear, clear that, that the, the Client, client respects, respects the, the cross, the cross, freedom, freedom to pursue, pursue, a, a to effectively, effectively pursue a good life, good life. Um, um, Or the client values that freedom. The client, the client may, may, not may not care. The client may, may, may not not uh, have that as an end. And that may be that the process, process is frustrating to some as some extent, not as a means, and not as, not as, as much of an end as she ought to be. And that would be a problem. To see why this might happen, I want to look at 
at some, some of the other, other um, um, hodgepodge prostitutions that were at raisins. So, so, so this, one, this one is that, is that, is that, is that, is that prostitute prostitutes import acts for money. For money. Now, now, as, pr as Prograts points out, out, doctors and nurses import into acts, and it's not degrading to the nurse. However, however, um, um, this is a this weird, is a weird challenge. Um, doctors, doctors and nurses are not like not like to have to respect or spend to, to uh, intimacy. intimacy. See this, see this. Um, let's contrast and trust across the TV operating operator or gas gas patrol. Their gas or gas patrol is a hypothetical device device that touch touches somebody's hand hand causes causes it to have to have more gas more gas. So we can imagine imagine there are there are people who operate on gas or gas and throw them in there. Sort of require special setups and some skills to sort of to figure them figure them to you know respond respond to them. To work, to work on a particular person. person. Um, um, so, so, so gas for gas for hard for you know, is 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 well uh, uh, well well paid. Well paid. Um, um, that that your gas for gas for hard for you is like like doctor doctor or nurse or nurse. Um, um, in the sense the sense that, that they they are are involved all in in uh, some in some it's it's for the for the client. But but prostitute to is not is not gas for gas for hard for you. The prostitute is also also involved in their own intimate intimate. Parts, parts are involved, and so, and so, and that's and not that's like doctor, doctor. That's not like not like the best thing I've ever done. For example, yeah, for example yeah, yeah, makes makes clear, clear. The client, client in, in medical medical case, case VO, 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 doctor, doctor. Whereas in in the the case of prostitution, prostitution, mutual, mutual, it's revelation, revelation. And that means that means prostitution. The case of prostitution, prostitution is really not like the case of the doctor, or the nurse, or the nurse. On this point, 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 this that the intimate, intimate fact of the past of the intimate acts for money, money, and that is intimate, intimate, and feels and feels and so that that is not not um, um, degrade to great. On the other hand, other hand, um, like, they're, they're, they're not they're not all the same as same process, process, in which case, perhaps the perhaps the revelation, revelation, uh, 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 is is so so I I return to this. I mean, are you are you that some cases and is 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 and isn't. Degrading, degrading, degrading. Some cases are like are like this. We lost your professor, or you're or 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 in what sense? What sense? Well, 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 she has survived. survived. She, she sort of, sort of, um, um, uh, hangs, hangs on a, every whim, whim of, 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 of the client, client as, as, as if all that matters, matters what, is what the client, client wants. wants. And, and that, that she, is, she is there, there to highly, highly determine what ever, ever desires, desires, her own desires, 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 des
voice and their emotion and their reasoning and their thinking, thinking are very, are very important. They're right, they're right. And they, and they, they uh, uh, sell those, sell those services. And, and um, um, that's, I don't, I don't, doesn't seem to me that it's either integrating at all, at all. Again, so again, body, body, body services, services. Uh, 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 like the uh, 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 these, these not be, not be great either. either. So, so, um, um, selling, selling these parts, parts of the body, body, um, um, or, or the use, of use of the body, body, body um, um, is not, not, uh, obviously, obviously degrading, degrading, yeah, doesn't mean, doesn't mean, isn't, isn't degrading, 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 just means, there are lots of examples, examples of, 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 um, um, Activities here are all sorts of similar, similar to prostitution that are not integrated. And, and, and um, um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think here, it's here, it's, it's important, important to notice, notice that, um, that, um, prostitution, prostitution is used for, for sexuality. sexuality. Um, um, and you choose, 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 you so she so has, she her, has own her own uh, uh, sexual uh, sexual identity, 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 sexual desires. desires. Now, now um, um, the question the that is, what's the relationship between uh, her, sexual her sexual identity, identity, identity her sexual desires, 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 and what she does, she does it with a prostitute, the, 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 the client. client. Now, um, it might very well be that, that, that um, her, her uh, uh, I mean, she may actually have some higher, higher, a very, very strong sexual desire to have sex with you know, this, this is client, client. Um, um, or, or uh, she, uh, may she may not, she may not, she may not have, have a sexual, sexual, uh, um, uh, sexually negative, negative reaction, reaction, reaction to client. It might be it might sexually, sexually neutral, it might, might be that, that you know, she knows she's okay, okay, that, that her attitude, attitude is, is, is one of uh, uh, sort of sexual, sexual neutrality, neutrality in this case. case. Um, um, it doesn't seem to me that her sexual activity involves any alienation of her own sexual desires. I think that what's problematic in selling one's body body Self, 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 that is that one, one loses control, control, control and, and the control, control has to hand in the hands of the other person. person. And one way, one way, it's like you have to straight to straight to court, to court, not considering the same as another, another way, which that might have, might happen, is, is that, that your body, your body disposed of in ways, ways, that ways that you do not want, want to be disposed, disposed of. of. Um, um, things happen, things happen, you do not want to have it to happen, and that you definitely don't want to have it to happen. And, um, um, uh, in, uh, in, in that, in that case, case, one can see, one okay, yes, 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 how you have sort of, sort of alienated, alienated your, 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 your soul, soul, your body, body, all your soul, in a way, because, because you've alienated, alienated it. It's no longer no doing, the doing the thing, thing that you think is, is, it's worth doing, doing. doing. But, but that's not that's in terms of prostitution, um, because, because it's not, it's not clear that, that what the prostitute does, it has to be, be, um, contrary to her sexual desires. It may not, may not actively sexual desires, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean it's, it's sexually opposed either. Okay, okay, but nonetheless, but nonetheless I, think I think that, that, that um, um, there can be a problem with prostitution. I think I that, that prostitution, prostitution in general, general and as, as such, is probably, is probably uh, 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 at least, well, well, I don't, I don't think it's probably, probably not degrading. It hasn't been established that it is. That is. However, I think the material materials that we've just been working through the arguments that we do provide is the materials to see how for women, women in, in uh, uh, very constrained situations, situations um, um, even even though they may, may uh, uh, formally consent to, to, uh, uh, to prostitution, to sexual activity, activity, all laws, they may or may not be degraded because of ways in which the prostitution act is damaging to their substantial freedom to, as opposed to their freedom from. So, so we began, began discussion. I want to uh, recall, recall uh, the example of the Hounded Woman in the Hounded Woman article. article. So the Hounded the Hounded Woman on the island, island, island was just a spot experiment. experiment. She was on the island by herself. There's nothing to do with her anymore. She survived, survived. But it's a beat, beat town. It's called the Chase and Chase. And in order to remain safe, she has to constantly stay on the island. Constantly, constantly on guard. And she can do this. She can see it. She's never caught. However, she's never able to 
devote themselves to, to, to uh, uh, anything, 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 anything that she thinks is actually value, value, and, and make, make, make life, life good. good. Life, 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 she thinks she's your mind, your mind, value, value, but, but, um, she thinks it's value, value, uh, substantially, or in large part, of her needs and needs other very valuable things, and those, those she cannot, cannot realize. So, so, is she free? Well, well, I mean, she can acknowledge all the rational transformations, appropriate to those ends. She's not being coerced. Um, but but the means available to her, to her um, um, are very limited. Very limited. She, has, she has to kind of run, run. And so the means so the ends that she can realize also also are very limited. And so so um, um, yes, if it's consider consider her, her what we might call substantial autonomy, autonomy. Uh, uh, what does she what have she freedom, freedom to do? do. Uh, uh, not not very much. Very much. She has freedom to do and she has not freedom to do what she wants. We could say that she has formal autonomy, but limited autonomy. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna use this use this example, example of the hound of woman woman short the short 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 so the first of the first reason we have the short 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 and so, and so uh, she chooses to have the chicken, the chicken, the chicken. Yeah. she's not, she's not as worse, no one is no one is turned, no one is putting her head, um, it's just a matter of what, what options are there, what the situation, situation is. So she's, so she's, she really, she really chooses to do this, but, but, um, uh, it seems like she's not, 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 um, um, is it degrading? Is it degrading? Well, it yeah, might be, it might be a little bit. It might be a little bit, but it's all in the past. It's not real life. All she's doing is doing is helping others with chicken, chickens. And also, and also uh, uh, maybe the other employers, employers care, care, all that, all that, all that, care about, care about is her, her, her feather, 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 ability, and being treated, treated really, really, feather, feather, sort of, sort of a, a, a feather, feather, who can really, really choose, choose to quit whenever they want, they want, they choose, choose, and it's me, me. We have it. We have it. Orange to feather, right? Right. Yeah. Management says, says, says um, okay, okay. I'm not. I'm not going to force you. Force you being a feather, feather, feather. Um, you're going to be a feather, feather. Not that's your decision. Decision. That's your decision. decision. That's that's. I don't care about care about beyond beyond that. Like you, like you, you choose to be a feather, feather. Do that. Do that. But but your your welfare beyond that beyond that is no no interest to you whatsoever. Whatsoever. And your personality, your your ability, ability, interest, interest, love, love. I could I could care less. And so, and so the fact that I was sort of a relationship, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, feather, feather, so feather, so feather, has, 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 so, so I'm going to suggest that that's, that's, that's kind of, kind of, like, situation, situation, the house cost to, but, but, um, um, see, see, why, why, but you might, you might think, okay, well, that's going to be, um, um, just, just, uh, 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 you know, you know, the how of the house is just, just like, just like the how of the factor, and what I want, what I want to suggest, that's not, that's not, so the, 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 um, um, how to process the worst situation, the how to the how of the factor, because of how this how is having a self-relation, relation, an intimate self-relation, a relation to all involved, and the importance of social identity, then they're all, they're all involved in prostitution, prostitution, or not, they're not, the fact, the fact, and see this, see this, it's going to help, it's going to help, instead of a night of a night, you're going to sing your best, again, so, so, I'm not singer, and the, 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 and they're not, they're not, they have, they have, they have, they have, they could do, could do something more than they wanted to, that would be, that would be, um, say, say, I mean, uh, potentially, 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 potentially rich, rich. Um, um, uh, certainly, uh, certainly, uh, a lot of this levels, um, they're not, 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 or social social pressure, or anything. And and D D in this case, in this case, the attractive, attractive aspects, aspects of the job, the job uh, uh, of of you know, doing doing jobs in public with others, or seeing or seeing public public sharing sharing with those, those are attractive. And so it's not just not just happen happen to do this thing, this thing that has a heavily regulatory aspects to it. Take freely freely to do do these to 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 do do um to to engage in an organization that has these has these work aspects aspects aspect. chosen the chosen the uh, the chosen chosen part because, because it has those aspects. aspects so so we have we have self self revelation 
but, but we also we also have lots of our time. And, and so, so um, uh, I guess, uh, I guess, I guess that in some cases, some cases, prostitution, prostitution that's missing, missing, that is that's a problem. The worry is, the worry is this. Um, uh, what if, what if the lady, 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 because it's because it's substantial and autonomous. autonomous. Because, because, because uh, the, uh, the, 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 the senior and senior friends have lots of lots of freedom to, and they, and they, and and they, they exercise, exercise that freedom, that freedom, freedom to, uh, 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 there are all, there's all these males male things, she and she this particular one, and, and they endorse door self-preservation. And that's why self-preservation is not great and great. Well, if that's so, then someone similar is like the factor actor worker, the hounded woman, whose option is not factor actor, but to be a prostitute to is, being pushed into a situation, situation where they don't, they have, don't have the freedom, freedom to, and there is, is self-preservation. And so, and so what, what text, text the, the um, um, night club singer, 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 the professor, the professor uh, uh, namely, namely, their full, full substantial, substantial autonomy, autonomy um, is, is lacking, lacking, uh, that uh, that uh, the, 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 the very other very other problem she wants to is education at least at least three three she has clear other options she shows she shows that she's not stigmatized um most and most of she needs sex sex with her body body and she enjoys getting her pleasure she has good working working conditions and she has a part of her actual activity until it's more important for her clients so so uh uh see see you know you know she has sex with sex clients and clients pay her pay her um and so in that sense um she doesn't perhaps fully endorse the endorse the to change the age to make money money but that's just that's just like many survivors you know many many lawyers lawyers Therapists, therapists and, and so on and so on. They enjoy the value of the service line, bond, they want to sue, sue, whatever, whatever. They enjoy the value of the service line, bond, but they're not, they're not free, free for free. Um, so, so it's compatible with having the only value on the one hand, one hand, they have the free for free, other hand, so the fact that the fact of prostitute, yes, yes, she won't, she won't, she won't pay her, pay her, but she doesn't, she doesn't, she doesn't, what she's doing, she's good, she's good, it's just that she wants the money, the money, just like, just like any, any other service line for money, the money, the money. So, so, um, um, in this case, in this case, I think, I think I, 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 it's this, this, this uh, uh, honest process, to me, to me, to me not, seems not to be great. Right. Because she's fully, fully um, uh, 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 embracing, embracing uh, 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 the activity, activity that is compatible with what her uh, sexual, uh, sexual desires are, 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 and it does not, it's not consistent with them. Okay, now, now, um, um, let's consider the hardest process, so this, 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 let's suppose this process is educated, educated, has limited, has limited options, options. She doesn't she doesn't really enjoy enjoy strangers. She doesn't take as much much satisfaction and social pleasure pleasure that is given to her to We can imagine she has been working, working working conditions, conditions and that and that yeah, the uh, actual uh, sexual activity activity forms forms clients clients not they're not very autonomous. So so unlike the unlike the promise philosophy, how he has to be not not fine in terms of value value and service to that she finds lines. It's it's um so so it's not, it's not well, 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 yes, it's worthwhile, while, while, but you're living in something else, I'm doing, 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 paying me, paying me, it's, it's uh, uh, I have to do it because, because I need to make a living to live. I think this, I think this is, is not all that. So the process of how the process of how is not, it's not disposed of body, but in the way that she sees, she sees those fitness of what is going on, what's happening, happening in her employment is not, is not compatible with her sexual desire. Again, again, we damage, damage, has to be passed, and she's missing. Um, her sexual sexuality is very, very useful, and she does not, does not endorse for the sake. She doesn't, she doesn't think they're worthwhile on their own. And so these things are happening to her, to her, um, these very, 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 that she does not say yes, and yes, I think that's good. Um, yeah, Thomas, 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 yes, 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 Overall, she wants she wants to like the head of the house, she wants to sell to somebody to have the house because she wants to money, she wants to money, she wants to work on the less and less as a sexual action. It's not something she wants to have to happen. 
again, again, this prophecy may be made hard to our eyes, and lies, and talk forward, forward, simulating, simulating, and rational, and so on, so on, so on, she doesn't, she doesn't very experience, and the other prophecy is probably, probably, like this, 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 also, also, um, um, so we have this, we have this, we have this, we have this, very, very strange, and all this way, pretty clearly, she's lacking, lacking, uh, freedom, freedom, too. But, but, you can imagine, imagine her clients, clients, and her manager, manager, her employer, her, employer, her, him, him, don't care. Don't care. They, they have no, they have no interest, interest in the fact, in the fact that, that she, she has very little, very little freedom, freedom, too. Um, um, they're not, they're not going to, of course, or doing something, something that she, that she doesn't choose to do, but, but, the fact that she has very options, 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 that are, options, options that, are, that are available to her, to her, are very, very attractive, and the aspects are very attractive, attractive to her, they, they don't, don't care. And, and, right, so that's the clients, clients and the, the, the um, employer, 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 now in a way, in a way, of course, it's true of lots and lots of interactions, interactions, and any personal interactions that you have, and have it with us drivers, with driver, the cashier, she, right? Right. Um, um, you, you, basically, basically, um, you may very, very, very well not care, care, care at all, at all, um, um, in a particular interaction, interaction about the degree to which the person is perceived to, uh, to uh, live a real life, life, uh, uh, to which they have, they have freedom, freedom, um, um, I don't know, you may care, but they don't even be able to raise any of them just now, now, um, um, but the thing is, in that interaction, the issue, the issue, the question, the, the, um, the, the, the salesperson's freedom to pursue the ends that are more important, um, and to sort of have these kinds of ends that I'm talking about, talking about, talking about, from, from that list, from this one earlier, earlier. That, that freedom, freedom too, too, the degree to which the, the, the salesperson has to bring too many too. It's not an issue, issue, issue in your interaction, interaction with, with salesperson. It's not it's something, something that something that comes up. So, so your, your concern for lack of 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 of is of lack 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 but, but because, because, of because of the nature, nature of, of the activity, activity because, because uh, uh, sexual activity is, is such an important, important um, part of part of life, life. life. I think it's, I think it's, it's, it's um, sort of inevitable that the question, the question of, of um, um, to what extent, to what extent uh, is the, uh, the uh, um, prostitute, prostitute Is the is is activity, activity, activity um, um, the sexual activity, sexual activity, activity sort of, does it mean that meet her sexual sexual ends? It's inevitable that that a question that's on the table, table that, that something, something that, that, that um, you know, possibly can be thinking about, and, about and, and the client, uh, client uh, can be thinking about, thinking about, about and, and the client, client um, doesn't address, address it, doesn't pay the concern to it, then, then there, there, client, client is in some way disrespecting the prostitute's freedom freedom to access a rich and pursue them, pursue them, in a way that we don't, don't interact with a constrained, constrained, um, say, salesperson, because you're not saying, saying, I don't care, care, it's important, important, I just, you know, you know, do the thing, the thing, um, um, you just say, say, here's, here's the money, the money, let me have it, sure, sure, so, so, I think I think that this is that this miss makes the kind of prostitute situation, 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 situation than, than, than uh, other uh, other uh, sort of uh, sort of low status status sales sales jobs because because, because of, the of the fact the fact that the prostitute the, prostitute, um, um, the people who do not interact with her don't care care about her her so in the worst case worst case we have social sphere sphere prostitute economy economy to to what she has the option options to realize realize limited limited. In the eyes of others, she's seen, 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 no, she's seen, she's seen, and we don't, we don't coerce you, we don't have on that, we don't care, care, care about these terms, you realize your ends, your ends. She may be behaving with integrity, integrity, because of the need to simulate, simulate, arousal, arousal, and attraction, attraction. She may lose, 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 may from her, her, sexual, sexual desire, desire, and, um, um, sexual body parts, and so forth, uh, um, and and it's 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 factors, factors, factors individually, individually, individually and together, 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 perhaps, perhaps are degrading. Are degrading. And so, and so I'm inclined to think that, that, that um, well, prostitution, well, prostitution is not necessarily more degrading. 
for people to do it and do it and do it. Maybe, maybe. It's not, it's not something we would have been otherwise. And given, given the important nature of the activity, the fact that they're not aging, aging, don't force it, force it. That, I think, is the thing that's probably the problem. And unlike unlike other options, it's more than more than like so and so money we want to otherwise we have to track it. It's because it's the sexual sexual nature of it. Is more more the the fact that the sexual nature makes it makes it more important to the person person themselves. So um um. In consider in considering what happened to the factory, factory, factory worker, worker um, um, plucking feathers, feathers, presumably, you know, something that's very, very, very important, like one way or the other, other to, to uh, uh, factory, factory worker, it doesn't matter, matter whether or not feathers are placed this way, this way, in that way, in that way, I mean, of course, they can't get around it's easier to do it, it's way, it's not a way, that way, and that way, that way, that way, that you know, frustrated, frustrated, you're not allowed to pluck the feathers in the chicken, in the chicken, in the chicken, but it's like not, not the same order as, as, um, having, having, uh, what kind of sexual relations relation relation you do, you don't have. Don't have. So, 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 this is, this is, it's some, some conjecture, conjecture um, um, about, about, uh, <sighs> what kinds of, of, um, um, relation, relation prostitute, prostitute, uh, uh, has, has to, to her, her, her uh, sexual, sexual being when she's had, she's had, not, she really, she really is, is daily, daily away from it, from it. Uh, But, but uh, uh, the fact that others, others, others care about, about her, that's that very matter. The, the fact, fact that, that she is not despising her sexuality in the way, the way, way that she was desired to, desire to, that's very, very clear. clear. Uh, uh, and those, uh, those, uh, I think, those are those are those are those are No, no. This is not, 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 this
caregiver uh, uh, so that they, they are, are the same, same as people, people who are receiving care, care. Uh, uh, and that and that is in is fact illegal, illegal. Um, illegal. Um, because, um, because it because it certain 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 uh, clients, clients, clients have, have for their privacy. 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 Uh, uh, but but question is, is, is what about what about selling plus plus and plus and that's where that's where things get interesting. Interesting. Now lots of examples examples. So so food we have we have as an airline airline apparently started out west west kind of like like the clears of air. Um, you can imagine that secretary, secretary services, services uh, uh, being discriminatory towards where it's having to do with sexual service. Parents. You can imagine the law firm being discriminatory towards in uh, certain, certain ways. And and those those are, are, are clearly out of bounds. So, so, but if, if they were, if they were the, the, the issue is, issue is, is um, um, if you're selling, you're selling sex, sex, then, then you can discriminate. Can discriminate. So the question so is, why can't you sell sex, 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 um, And then discriminate on the basis of, well, I'm well, selling all these other things. things. I'm just selling just selling things. I'm discriminating. I'm selling sex, 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 the and that's and that's what the next article is, is going to be about. about is, is uh, explaining uh, why why in certain uh, cases uh, sexual sexual uh, uh, discrimination uh, uh, is legitimate. Why why can be can be kind of contained contained and not and not spread spread to the to the um uh, uh, the economy economy and and why and why why entertainment that leave that leave entertainment can be justified justified in in principle principled way. So you rock you rock the article article the author is on the field of the she called 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 she, she doesn't. Does she? Could she? Could uh, formally formally uh, position position of a of a robust robust liberal liberal says says that uh, the important the important is not just right is for us but also to to and and uh, uh, we need we need uh, and and, and, and uh, sex uh, plus plus uh, business businesses would would uh, violate violate would would, would, would impinge impinge freedom too and, and so then so then liberal as well as well action action could display why why. These businesses, these businesses um, the sex and sex businesses, businesses are problematic, oh, and should and should be legal about it. Just just the issue issue is when she says she says transactions, think think um um on the front of the front of the front the idea idea that um um the individuals in states states have an interesting interest in both of the same and good life um um. And and the position may not be by or only state state and other and other and in the middle of having just another seat of having substantial financial freedom freedom to do. And if that's if that's right, right then then she doesn't she doesn't have to be uh uh peer election section and just to appeal to the idea to that to that idea that the state state individual have an interest interest in in um citizen citizens of the society society all have all have a substantial freedom to do to and um liberal liberal and the protection of section saying yes, yes. Good, good that that um Okay. Okay. So, so um, um, like I said, I said there, there are large lines, lines in the um, um, uh, uh, recording. And, and uh, uh, yeah, yeah. that's 